Hello and welcome to our reading of What About Bob? So I'm Kate. I will be doing your scene description tonight and I'm uh, joined by several of my friends. First is Colby. Colby is going to play the amazing Bob Wiley. Amazing. Next, we have George, the amazing sassy man who's going to play Dr. Leo Marvin, as well as a couple of minor characters for us. Siggy is going to be played by my friend Jeremy. He's going to play some other lines for us. There's a lot of lines here. Anne is going to play Anna and a lot of other important people. Karina is going to play Mrs. Gutman and Faye, as well as some other important people. Leo's sister Lily is going to be played by Rudy. Rudy's going to help us out with some of the other parts as well. And finally, Travis is going to play Mr. Gutman and several other important people. Hang on, sorry, so, Travis just dropped out. Alive. All right, so everybody introduced, so we're going to go ahead and get started with What About Bob? What About Bob? Opening crawl on a black screen. Medical journals report only 31 cases in history of people swallowing their toothbrushes. The champion toothbrush swallower was a Soviet psychiatric patient who downed 16 in 1984. The all-time champion swallower of any object swallowed 2,533 objects in 1927. A toothbrush, credits rolling. We hear a man clearing his throat. He enters and a shiny glob of toothpaste is squeezed under the bristles. Interior, Bob Wiley's bathroom, morning. Bob Wiley, 30s, anxious, begins brushing his teeth. Suddenly, in trying to brush back a molar, Bob loses control of the toothbrush and swallows half of it whole. Choking, gasping, he tries to pull the toothbrush out. Exterior, Bob Wiley's, Wiley's apartment building. Pan and tilt up from a woman walking her dog on the streets of Manhattan to a third floor apartment window. There's Bob struggling frantically with the toothbrush. Interior Bob Wiley's bathroom morning. Bob is losing the battle, and in the three excruciating swallows, like a mouse going down the throat of a snake, the toothbrush disappears down his throat. Bob pounds his chest, swallowing as he does. Then, delicately, he belches. He takes a deep breath, relaxes somewhat, and opens the medicine cabinet. There sits ten packaged toothbrush. Bob opens one. As we roll credits, Dissolve to exterior parking lot, Lake Winnipesaukee, New Hampshire, day, in the middle of autumn. Pricey BMWs, Mercedes, and so forth, sport license plates with Dreed, Red, Jingrich, Haddock, Perka, Dan, etc. Three preteens ride by on a bike and shove the trunks of the cars. Car alarms sound off like birds. We pan with the kids, then pass them out to the sea. Exterior, middle of the lake aboard a Chris Craft, same. Four psychi psychiatrists and three spouses are pleasure boating. Here, all is quiet except the wind and the sound of the birds. Or is it the car alarms? Shrinks and their wives sit in in t intense doctor in his 40s. I've had the same nightmare three nights running. Come on, David, we're on a vacation. I'm leaving my office for summer vacation when suddenly my patients rush up looking insane. Exterior Park Avenue office building day. Dreamlike slow motion. Dr. Feinberg exits the building with his suitcase. To his horror, an angry horde of men and women looking like sadistic lynch mob swarm him and attack. Don't leave us, they scream. Then they beat me and bite me and kill me. As Feinberg runs to get away, he's dragged down then overrun by his angry patients. Back to the boats. It's the worst nightmare I've had since residency. Night after night. It's terrifying. At least your nightmare is only a dream. What about what happened to Leo Marvin? Who's Leo Marvin? You never heard of the famous Dr. Marvin? Angle on a vacant lot on shore. There's a dock, an overgrown slab, and a chimney. That used to be his vacation house. There's nothing there. Back to the boat. Grab a strong drink and some Dramamine. I'll tell you a story that will send you into Rorschach. Who's Leo Marvin? Well, I really can't tell you about Leo Marvin unless I first tell you about Bob. Who's Bob? Exterior of the streets of Manhattan. Upper West Side, day. The sound of birds segues to car alarms. 
We're on the streets of New York, craning and zooming like a bird up into the sweltering apartment. Interior Bob Wiley's apartment. Bob sits at the, on his bed in boxer shorts. On his nightstand are cardboard plaques. One lists the warning signs of diabetes. Another lists cancer's seven warning signals. Stacked by the bed are psychology books and a few bottles of prescription pills. In front of a Bob, in front of Bob is a vaporizer. Bob holds his cheeks and twists them in small circles in front of the steam. I feel good. I feel great. I feel wonderful. I feel good. I feel great. I feel wonderful. Uh, who's I Lee Marvin? I know I've heard the name. Was he the guy who specialized in necrophiliacs? No. If you must. Interior psychiatrist's office. The striking thing about Dr. Leo Marvin's office is order and neatness. As Marvin talks on the phone, he unconsciously adjusts his already meticulous place gigaws on his desk. Marvin is mid-40s, authoritative, stiff, perfect, perfectly manicured. Adorning the office are diplomas, personal mementos, primitive masks, Mondorian-like paintings, his medical school grades, a bust of Freud, and diplomas. On his desk is a book titled Baby Steps with Marvin's picture on it. Well, of course I want to publicize the book, Hugo, and it's a wonderful opportunity, but it's my vacation. The Today Show went to Dr. Ruth's vacation house. Why can't CBS Morning come to Lake Winnipesaukee? Would you work on it? Thank you, Hugo. I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Marvin, there's a Dr. Carswell Finsterwald calling. He said you went to school together? Finsterwald. Carswell Finsterwald. It sounds familiar, but they sure come out of the woodwork when you get famous, Claire. Put him through. Leo. Carswell. Interior, another psychiatrist's office. Carswell Finsterwald looks unstable. As he talks on his phone, he's boxing up his office. Prominent on his desk is a copy of Marvin's book. The conversation intercuts. Long time no see, huh? You have a big book out. Things are clicking, huh? That's the way I planned it. Listen, Leo. I'm closing my practice. Most of my patients are on the west side, but I have one case I'd like to refer you. As well, thanks, but... I know, you're incredibly busy. Swamped, I've raised my rate. I might even cut my sessions to 40 minutes. Leo, I know you don't like flattery, but if anybody I know is going to win a Nobel Prize, it's you. You gotta be thinking about your next book, so I know you'll find this case particularly interesting. What sort of case is it, Carswell? Marvin paces. He adjusts his diploma down, then up, then down. Actually, Leo, I don't know. Carswell, if this is a dysfunctional... No, no, nothing like that. He keeps his appointments, pays on time, see him once. If he's not the most complex and persistent case you've ever seen, drop him. His name's Bob Wiley. <laughs> he needs someone brilliant. Okay, I'll work him in for an interview. Uh, say, Carswell, how come you're quitting the business? We're a dying breed, Leo. Good luck. Mr. Well hangs up. He lets out a silent, jubilant howl of gleeful laughter. I feel good. I feel great. I feel wonderful. Angle in Marvin's office. Marvin slowly hangs up his speakerphone. Carswell Fensterwald. Again, he racks his brain. He presses his intercom. Uh, Claire, if I get a call from a Bob Wiley, schedule him for a short interview after vacation. Uh, he's already called Dr. Marvin twice. Uh, he's coming in this afternoon. That's persistence. Carswell Finsterwald. Marvin gives up. He picks up a copy of his book, compares his jacket photo with his reflection in the handle of the letter opener. Exterior aboard the Chris Craft boat. The shrinks are all still listening to Dr. Number Three. They're definitely listening ah, to find her. Leo Marvin. Now I remember an incredible hassle. Mm, uh, 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 uh. And that stupid bestseller 
what was the name of it? Is that watching grass grow is more exciting than Leo Marvin? All that changed. Why? That's what I'm trying to tell you, Lummoxes. Bob! Interior Bob's apartment. Bob is sitting by the stream, repeating his mantra. I feel good. I feel great. I feel wonderful. I feel good. I feel great. I feel... Bob picks up the phone and frantically pushes buttons. Hello, Claire. Bob again. Are you sure Dr. Marvin doesn't have an earlier cancellation? Sorry. See, see you at two. Sharp. Bob hangs up, finds a blood pressure gauge, and takes his blood pressure. That done, he stands, paces, then stops and sprinkles food into a goldfish bowl. Good morning, Gil. I said, good morning, Gil. Gil, the goldfish, nibbles the food. Bob sits on his bed, takes a deep breath, then dials the phone. As he waits for an answer, he flips through his organizer, which is crammed with notes and papers. Overton. This is Bob Wiley calling. Mrs. Patricia Lyons, please. Bob waits a beat, still looking through the notebook. Lyons. Mrs. Lyons, I'm Bob Wiley. I represent the Manhattan Dental Hygiene Association. I can offer you a 40% discount on our toothpicks, plus a very attractive selection of toothpick holders if... Mr. Wiley. Bob. Bob, this is an elementary school. Elementary school? I thought you were over 10 cafeteria. No, we're a school and we don't need toothpicks. I don't know. A young tooth is a terrible thing to waste. I should know. When I was that age, nobody gave a hoot about my teeth and now they're terrible. Have you checked out flavored floss? Flavored floss? All you have to do is dream pink gums, Patsy, and we can make them happen. Give me your address and I'll send you our flossing catalog. As Bob begins to write in his notebook, he flashes a V for victory at Gill. Interior Bob's apartment later. Bob is now dressed to go out. A clock reads 1.45 p.m. Bob is pacing at the door. He stops, glances at the clock, faces the door, opens it, closes it, paces, opens the door, takes some deep breaths, twists his cheeks, then like a man jumping into cold water, he bolts out the door. Interior hallway outside Bob's apartment. Bob exits his apartment and uses Kleenex to close the door. Then he heads down the stairs. In the doorway to Bob's apartment, Sweat pouring off his brow, he stands in sunglasses in the entranceway to the apartment. A bus squeals up to the curb, belches smoke, then moves on. A garbage can is kicked over. Bob starts to take a step when suddenly he gets dizzy. He steps back and hyperventilates. Bob puts on a dust mask, dust mask steps bravely onto the sidewalk, and walks eyes fixed forward. I feel good. I feel great. I feel wonderful. A man passes Bob. Eyes fixed forward. Son of a bitch, dirty bastard, I'll get you! Exterior, the streets of Manhattan. Day. Long shot. Bob walks through the city like a zombie. Eyes fixed forward. Interior office building lobby in Manhattan. Passersby shuffle to and fro. Bob, still in sunglasses and dust mask, enters. He walks in a straight line to the directory and finds Dr. Leo Marvin, a psychi psychiatric corporation, suite 4616. Help you? This startles uh, Bob, but he recovers. I'm going to see Dr. Leo Marvin. Second, Second elevator. Elevator. Thanks. Angle on the elevators. Bob removes a Kleenex from a pack in his pocket, uses it to push the elevator button, then paces nervously. The elevator arrives and the door opens. The elevator is filling up with passengers. Bob doesn't move. Interior steel and concrete stairwell. We see a descending steel staircase and stairwell door marked floor 40. We hear footsteps, rhythmic and determined, getting closer and closer. I feel good. I feel great. I feel wonderful. Interior, Dr. Marvin's reception room. Claire sits behind her desk reading a book. Bob enters, red face and out of breath, taking his pulse. Hi. I'm... 
Bob. Interior, Dr. Marvin's office. Dr. Marvin is at his desk and Claire shows Bob in. Dr. Marvin, Bob Wiley, thank you for working me in. Claire exits and Bob looks around and notices a framed photo on Marvin's shelf. Using his Kleenex, Bob picks it up and he smiles. Your family? Wait, let me guess. I'm good at this. Harriet, Kenny, Gretchen, Rita. Wait, wait, I know I'm close. Susan, Stephen, Andrea, Rita. Wait. This is my wife, Faye. That's my son, Sigmund, my daughter, Anna, and that's my sister, Lily. Lily, I was close. What a wonderful family. Bob puts the photo back on the shelf and Marvin adjusts it. Thank you. Do I call you Dr. Marvin or Leo? Whichever you prefer, have a seat. Call me Bob. Bob stares at the chair. There's a box of Kleenexes on the arm. Bob reaches in his pocket and takes out a Kleenex and uses it to move the box of Kleenexes to the table. He then sits. Marvin walks to Bob and holds out a trash can. Bob drops, drops the used Kleenex in. Thank you. Marvin puts the trash can next to Bob's chair and sits. He stares at Bob. He's waiting. I guess I'm on, huh? Well, the simplest way to put it is I have problems. I worry about diseases. I have trouble with toothbrushes and I uh, have problems moving. Talk about moving. As long as I'm in my apartment, I'm, I'm okay. I have a phone job selling dental supplies, and that's fine. But when I have to go out, I get weird. Talk about weird. I get dizzy spells, nausea, cold sweats, hot sweats, fever blisters, difficulty swallowing, difficulty breathing, blurred vision, involuntary trembling, dead hands, weak ankles, twitching, fainting spells, numb lips, do you think that's normal? That depends. Suddenly Bob removes an air sickness bag from his pocket. He opens it and pauses a long time as though he were about to vomit into it. He doesn't. He puts the air sickness bag away and Marvin leans in and Bob does too. You do go out, you know. I do. You came here. You're right. What are you afraid of? Well, what if I break my neck and become paraplegic? What if my heart stops beating and I can't find a bathroom and my batter, bladder explodes? You ever heard of Tourette syndrome? You know, where you involuntary uh, shout profanity? That's exceptionally rare. I have a neighbor who got it, yells, oh shit, in church, douchebag. I had customers at his job, pretty funny actually. <laughs> Unless you're the one with the disease, then it's sad. Shit eating son of a bitch! Just kidding. <laughs> Twat loving douchebag! Why are you doing this? Well, if I fake it, I don't have it. Like, when I think my heart is gonna stop, I fake it, so I know it's not happening. <laughs> Bob fakes a heart seizure, very convincingly, and falls to the floor. After a moment, he sits back in the chair as if nothing happened. If I can't make it happen, I know, I know it's not happening. I know it's all in my mind. Marvin stands and walks towards Bob. Get away from me with that knife! <laughs> See? Marvin uprights the trash can and walks back to his seat. Are you married? Divorced, actually. Want to talk about it? Well, the world is divided into two types of people. Those who like Neil Diamond and those who don't. My ex-wife loves him. Um. Dr. Marvin, do you think you can help me? There's a pause. Marvin leans in. There's a saying, Bob, that the best psychiatrist in the world is right inside of you. I can help you, provided you're willing to help yourself. Are you kidding? I'll do anything. Marvin stands and moves to the bookcase behind him. There's a groundbreaking book 
just came out, Bob. Not everything in it applies to you, but when you see the title, I think you'll see that it can help. There are 20 copies of Marvin's book on the shelf behind him. Marvin holds one up. Bob sees the cover. We see the picture of Marvin on the back. Baby steps. It means setting small, reasonable goals for yourself. One day at a time, one tiny step at a time. Doable, accomplishable goals. Baby steps. When you leave this office, don't think about everything you have to do to get out of the building. Just deal with getting out of the room. When you reach the hall, just deal with the hall, and so forth. Baby steps. Bob looks at Marvin and then stands. Baby step through the office. Bob takes small, deliberate steps to the door. He opens it and steps into the reception area. Baby step out the door. The door to the office closes. Then there's a long pause. Bob opens the door and pops back in. It works. It works. Of course. Of course. All I, all I have to do is take one small step at a time, and I can do anything. Exactly. But don't expect everything all at once. Even a baby occasionally falls and hits his head. Bob walks around the room as though he were inhabiting each small space with his body. Baby step around the office. Baby step around the office. Faye, Sigmund, Anna, Lily. Hi, fam. He's a genius. Marvin hands Bob the book. This will give you plenty to digest while I'm on vacation. V vacation? Oh, well, certainly my secretary told you. As of this afternoon, I'm on vacation with my family until Labor Day. That's a whole month. What if I need you? What if I need to talk? Dr. Harmon, my associate, will be happy to talk. He hands Bob Harmon's card. We have years ahead of us, Bob. A month will seem like a baby second. Marvin shows Bob the door. Bob, doing his baby steps, looks lost and confused. Can I call you in the Hamptons if I need you? Oh, Dr. Harmon is quite skilled. Bob shuffles to the door. I hear Maine is great this time of year. Marvin turns over his book and shows Bob his picture. I'll be with you the whole month. Try your baby steps. Let's see. Baby step through the office. Baby step out the door. That's perfect. Keep going. Baby steps to the hall. Baby. Marvin closes the door and starts back to his desk. Momentarily, Bob sticks his head back in. It's the cat skills, isn't it? Bob. Sorry. Baby steps. Baby steps. Bob exits, closing the door. Marvin starts to pick up Bob's trash can when Bob sticks his head in again. You flying or driving? Bob, I'll be back. Bob looks at Marvin and starts out. Baby steps, he'll be back. Baby steps, he'll be back. Bob closes the door behind him. From his desk, Marvin takes a plastic trash bag and dumps the contents of Bob's trash can into it. He picks up a small tape recorder and presses record. July 31st, Bob Wiley, introductory interview. Multiphobic personality characterized by an extreme need for family connections. Bill, 150 for the session and 29.95 for the book. He clicks the tape recorder off. There's a knock at the door. Bob. Uh, it's your publicist. He says CBS will come to Winnipesaukee. Yes. Marvin strides triumphantly to the phone and lifts it up. I knew they'd come to me. Uh, Hugo, not to change the subject, but has a psychiatrist ever won the Nobel Prize? Interior hallway of Marvin's office. Bob paces in front of the elevators, reading the book. Baby step to the elevator. Baby step to the elevator. The elevator, full of passengers, opens. Bob steps in. Baby step to the elevator. Baby step to the elevator. The elevator doors close and it starts down. Bob screams. Ah! Exterior, New, New York Marine Air Terminal. Marvin and the family, who we recognize from the pictures in his office, exit a cab with their luggage and head into the terminal. Hurry, 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 hurry. They pass a homeless man at the handout. Marvin's wife, Faye, stops and roots in her purse. Honey, there isn't time. 
Faye gives the man some money and enters the terminal. You're only encouraging them, Faye. Interior terminal. The Marvin family hurries through the terminal. Hurry, 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 hurry. Marvin's 16-year-old daughter, Anna, and 12-year-old son rush with them. Daddy, would you cut it out? The family finds their gate and gets in line to board. There are 10 people ahead of them and the plane isn't boarding it. All haste stops as they drop their luggage on the floor. See? Honey, I told you, there's no rush. A nice looking boy gets in line behind them and checks out Anna. She sees him and flips her hair. Ziggy, dressed all in black, plays a video game on his watch. It beeps and blurps. Faye lovingly plucks a piece of lint off Marvin's jacket. Ziggy looks up and plucks another piece of lint. Marvin takes out an electronic organizer. He pushes buttons and it beeps. Okay, how does this sound? Tomorrow we'll go shopping and clean up the house. Ooh, sounds great. Wednesday we'll rearrange the furniture and spruce up the lawn. More, I gotta have more. Thursday. <clears throat> Marvin clears his throat and smiles. The interview, the interview with Maria, Maria Schreiber. Schreiber. I'm having some art brought up from the city. The cottage should look spectacular. Faye kisses Marvin on the cheek. I'm sure whatever you do will look wonderful, honey. Marvin beams, then goes back to his organizer. After the interview, we'll take a celebration sail around the lake. Then Friday, my birthday, we'll have a wonderful meal at Bigby's. They straighten Siggy's shirt tail. Momentarily, Siggy's watch lets out a staccato series of beeps. Siggy, are you going to spend all summer driving us crazy with that? Not driving me crazy. Me either. Siggy continues his game. Faye touches Marvin on the hand to say, let it pass. Anna continues to flirt with the boy in line. Marvin pushes a couple of buttons on his organizer and it lets out three rapid beeps. Siggy smiles triumphantly at Marvin. You gonna do that all summer? Marvin ignores this and puts the organizer away. Yeah, Dad. Huh? Anna, you're masking hostility. Marvin reaches in his briefcase and removes two hand puppets. One has the still screen face of Anna, the other of Leo. Anna sees this and is incredibly embarrassed. Daddy, put those away! The line moves. Anna hurries into the rampway. Anna! Examine your behavior. Marvin and the family disappear into the rampway. Dr. Leo Marvin, pick up the white courtesy phone. Dr. Leo Marvin, please answer the white courtesy phone. Interior phone booth, New York Day. Close on a long list of airline phone numbers with all but the last one crossed out. Pull back to find... Bob standing at a payphone, receiver to his ear. He has Kleenexes protecting his hand, his ear, and his mouth. Outside the window is a hot dog stand. The vendor is serving up juicy hot dogs, and Bob watches longingly. I'm sorry, Bob. No one's answering the page. Thanks for trying. Bob hangs up, crumples the list. Exterior street outside the phone booth. Still looking at the hot dogs, Bob, sh Bob shuffles out of the phone booth. Still, he tosses his crumpled list in the trash can and misses. Even though there's litter on the street all around the trash can, Bob, using his Kleenex, picks up his list and puts it in the trash. He walks to the hot dog stand and watches. He wants a hot dog. Can I help you? Bob. Like a hot dog, Bob? Sure would. The vendor burns a hot, uh, a hot dog. Mustard? I sure would. Uh, I'd love it. The vendor holds out the dog. But I can't. I, I really want to, but I, but I can't. It's bird intestine and beef brain. Bob looks at the dog with a mixture of desire and revulsion. He pulls out in the air sickness bag, holds it at ready, then puts it back. Vendor retracts the dog. Hit the road, bub. Bob. Bob moves on. Interior, sunny New York flat. 
Bob, out of breath, knocks on the door. Helene Wiley, a late middle-aged woman draped in scarves, opens the door. She carries a palette knife and palette of paint. Hi, Mom. Bob, you didn't wake up again. I found this great psychiatrist who abandoned me. Helene turns and walks away. Bob follows her in. The next scene is played with Helene walking away and Bob following. They move through her apartment, dotted with finished, half-finished paintings on, on big canvases. Did you come here for money? Mom, that's a terrible thing to ask. How do you like my latest? She steps in front of a big canvas covered with knives, spoons, forks, paint, and $20 bills. Bob touches one of the 20s. It comes off in his hand. It's lovely, Mom. Helene takes the 20 and puts it back. Bobby, please. Mom, I'm sorry. I, all I wanted to do was talk. I'll go. She reaches out and embraces him. Oh, my poor baby. How did you get so screwed up? Oh, Mom. You're the only thing I care about. Always will be. Oh, um, Mom. They stand there hugging for a moment. I'm here for you, Bob, anytime. I love you, Mom. She looks at him and lovingly straightens his hair. Go home, sweetie. I need to work. Exterior street corner near the Metropolitan Museum. Bob stands on the corner looking like a lost soul. He watches as the world passes by. The light changes. Looking both ways constantly, Bob crosses. Baby steps across the street. Baby step across the street. A perfect little family walks past him. A five-year-old girl, three-year-old boy skip by, hand in hand. They wave at Bob, and he waves back, sadly, then continues. I feel good. I feel great. I feel wonderful. Interior baby direct decorated apartment. Crackling Rose by Neil Diamond plays on the stereo. Becky, a perky woman pregnant, about Bob's age, answers the door. Bob stands in the hallway. She's a little surprised. Hi. Whoa, you're really getting big. Bob gently puts a hand on Becky's belly. What a bruiser. Hi, little Bobby. Bob, he's not little Bobby. Feel the heartbeat? Bob puts his ear to Becky's belly and listens. Suddenly, he hugs Becky's tummy. Oh, Becky, let's get married again. Bob, you know I'm married to someone else now. But I want a baby, a family. I want to burp them and change them and... Love him. Why couldn't it have been with me? Bob, honey, we've been over this. You, as a father, think about it. Bob thinks. Becky looks at him sympathetically. There's still a warm spot in her heart for him. You know, I actually have considered naming him Bob. Really? Yeah, but it's still going to be Neil. Right. Interior Bob's apartment late afternoon. Bob sits alone watching Ozzy and Harriet. Ozzy is talking to Ricky, David, and Harriet. We're a family. We'll always be a family. I don't care what they say about you at school. We've got each other, and don't you ever forget it. The family hugs. The TV audience applauds. Bob picks up the phone and dials. Split screen with Mid Manhattan Exchange in one room, two operator answering service. Mid Manhattan Exchange. This is Bob Wiley. I'm a patient of Dr. Marvin's. I need to talk to him urgently. I'm sorry, Mr. Wiley. Bob. Bob, but Dr. Marvin is out of town and Dr. Harmon is taking his calls. I don't want Harmon. I need Marvin. Bob paces in the assumed false, then assumes a false calm. Look, there seems to be some confusion. You see Dr. Marvin, uh, Leo, wanted me to call him, but I lost his number. Bob, I can't give out that number. But you could call him and ask him to call me. It's awfully late. Bob is silent. Bessie is uncertain. Stay on the line, Bob. What's your number in case we disconnect? Exterior Marvin's vacation house porch. We recognize this is the same lake the doctors are sailing on in the opening scene. Gorgeous greenery, the shore lined with quaint but expensive summer homes. Where the doctors in the boat saw an empty slab stands the Marvin Summer House, a clapboard structure complete with a private dock, old one motorized rowboat, and diving board. Marvin is relaxing in a chair. Faye is in the background pl 
uh, putting out flowers. Marvin takes a deep breath, sighs peacefully, then picks up a book. Freud's understanding dreams and opens it. The phone rings. Marvin frowns, but answers. Triple ring with Bessie and Bob and Marvin. Yes. Dr. Marvin, this is Bessie. At your exchange, I'm sorry to disturb you, but I have a Bob Wiley on the line who says you'll want to talk to him. You know better than this, Bessie. Uh, Dr. Harmon is covering for I me. I told him that, Doctor, but he insists on talking to you. He says it's an emergency. Marvin frowns and takes a deep breath. Put him Go through. Go ahead, Bob. Back to double split screen. Bob's frantic pacing contrasts with Marvin's calm. Bob, I thought I made it clear to you that I'm on vacation. I know, but I'm a mess. Worse than usual. <laughs> Bob, if this is an emergency, go to the emergency room. If not, call Dr. Harmon, and I'm sure he can help. I'd feel better if I just knew where you were. It's Martha's Vineyard, right? Can we just talk? In, in my office, after Fire Labor Fire Island? Good night, Bob. Marvin hangs up, single screen. Bob hangs up, too. He stands and thinks and dials again. Split screen with mid-Manhattan exchange. Hi, this is Bob. Leo and I got cut off. I'm sorry, Bob, but Dr. Marvin just called and instructed me not to put you through. What? Bob stands thinking. Interior, a Manhattan payphone booth. A mid-twenties prostitute overly made up is on the phone. Split screen again with Mid-Manhattan Exchange. Mid-Manhattan Exchange. Hello, this is Leo, Lily Marvin, uh, Dr. Leo Marvin's sister. I, I have to talk to my brother right away. I'm not allowed to give out that number. Don't you have it? A pullback reveals Bob standing beside her, wearing his face mask, waiting anxiously. Bob whispers in the prostitute's ear, and she nods. Went on vacation and forgot to give it to me. Look, honey, it's urgent. I'm at 7908864. She reads the number off the payphone. Betsy reacts to the fact that it's a different number from Bob's. She shakes her head and sighs. Stay on the line, Miss Marvin. Prostitute lands the hands the phone to Bob. He sprays the phone with disinfectant and then hands her some money. Thanks. You were fantastic. The prostitute shakes her head and walks away. Interior Marvin's vacation house dining room. The moonlit lake is in the far background. In the near background, the Marvin family sits eating dinner. Marvin, holding the telephone, looking concerned, walks off by himself. Really? What's wrong? Split screen with Bob. Standing in his payphone, he cringes. Dr. Marvin, please don't be angry. It's Bob. I, I know I shouldn't call you this way, but... Bob, listen to me. The doctor-patient relationship is based on trust. When you call me against my wishes or pretend to be my sister, I can't trust you anymore. I know, but... Call Dr. Harmon or go to the emergency room, but do not call me here again. Marvin hangs up. Back to single screen. Bob stands in the phone booth, hanging his head on his his hand on his head. Oh, that wasn't smart. That wasn't smart. He walks out of the booth, shaking his head. He exits screen left. Momentarily, he crosses back through the screen, muttering to himself. Interior Mid Manhattan Exchange. Bessie sits at her switchboard, reading the re a Regency romance. The operator Gwen is doing her nails. There's a knock at the door. The operators look at each other, go to the door, but don't open it. Who is it? Uh, Detective Roberts. Homicide. I have some questions about a Bob Wiley. That was that sicko who kept calling Dr. Marvin. What about him? She opens the door. Detective Roberts is Bob. He's dead. Oh my god, what happened? Suicide, we think. 40 stories, free fall, splat. The operator gasps. Now, our records show that Bob made several calls to this number just before he died. Do we, did either of you know Bob personally? Bob called here trying to reach his psychiatrist. That's interesting. What happened? I put him through once. After that, Dr. Marvin didn't want to talk to him again. Uh-huh. Wait a minute. Dr. Marvin couldn't have had anything to do with Bob's death. Oh? Why not? Dr. Marvin's on vacation. 
Ah. Out of state, like Winnipesky. Michigan? New Hampshire. New Hampshire? We're not supposed to give out the number, but I can call him and... That's okay. I'm sure we can find him if we need him. Bob writes down the information as he walks to the door. God, I feel terrible. What if I was the last person he talked to before he died? I frankly wouldn't let it bother me. This guy had Skydiver written all over him, if you know what I mean. Bob closes the door behind him. Exterior answering service hallway. Bob almost throws up, then puts the air sickness bag away again. He takes a deep breath, smiles to himself, then exits. Interior Marvin's summer house bedroom. Marvin and Faye are asleep in bed. The phone rings. Faye turns on the light. Better not be who I think it is. Marvin answers the phone and Faye listens. Hello? What? That's okay. Thanks for calling, Bessie. Marvin hangs up and sits up, stunned. That was my service. That that patient, the one who called earlier, he committed suicide. Oh, Leo, that's ter how horrible. Faye rubs Marvin's neck. There is a long pause. Oh, well. Let's not let her ruin our vacation. Marvin turns out the light and lies down. Interior bus station morning. Bob wears Bermuda shorts and a baseball cap. In one hand, like a security blanket, he clutches a paper bag spilling over with clothes, bottles of pills, and baby steps. In the other hand, he clutches a baggy holding gill. Eyes fixed ahead, Bob stares at the bus looming large like a growling, grumbling, snorting monster. Bus employee approaches. This is the last bus. How many tunnels does it pass through again? How many bridges? Keep your eyes you there. You. Baby steps, board the bus. Baby steps, board the bus. Bob looks at the bus again. He tips his bottle of pills and swallows. He takes a small baby step towards the bus. I think you could do it today, Bob. We have a baby. Baby step, board today. Baby step, board today. Bob inches into the bus. Interior bus. The bus driver sits ready to go. Bob walks like a cripple down the aisle to an empty seat. Baby step down the aisle. Baby step down the aisle. The passengers, a scurvy bunch, wait impatiently. Bob finally takes a seat next to an old man and smiles nervously. Hi, I'm Bob. The old man scowls and looks forward. The bus driver closes the door and the bus moves forward with a jolt. Ah. Would you knock me out, please? Hit me in the face, whatever you have to. Just knock me out. The old man moves away. Bob downs more pills. Interior of the Holland Tunnel. The bus speeds through and we hear a long, loud scream. Exterior, Marvin Porch. Marvin lies down in the hammock and picks up his book. Faye enters. Honey, let's go to the shore. Exterior, open countryside. The Greyhound bus stops. Bob gets out and runs into a field. He apparently vomits, then runs back to the bus. Interior Lake Winnipesaukee General Store. The Marvin family strolls through this old-fashioned general store leading, uh, loading food and supplies into a shopping cart. They're all in sort shorts and looking resortly, except for Siggy, who's in his usual all-black garb. Through the windows outside, we can see the quaint little town of Winnipesaukee. Hugo said to expect 11. Are you sure we have enough? We can feed the entire network, honey. Relax. Anna joins them and tosses in some cookie. Uh, by the way, did you call Ted Fien? Why? He's a tsunami with eyes. I thought he was cute. Uh, how would you know a boy is cute? Are you coming out of the closet? Anna, be, Anna, be nice. Uh, she's just testing us, Faye, but don't get psychosexual with me, young lady. Me? When you want to call... Some guy, I'm sorry, when you want me to call some guy because his father's your publicist? Yeah, Dad, don't be a psychosexual pimp. Siggy, don't talk that way to your father. They're both testing us, Faye. Don't buy into it. 
Yeah, Mom, it's not meant for you. It's meant for Dad. Testing. One, two, three. Testing. Exterior of the bus stop across from the general store. A Greyhound bus pulls into the bus stop. Passengers hurry off, anxiously glancing behind them. Finally, Bob, covered in sweat, exits. Holding his bag and fish, squinting to adjust this uh, to the sun, he stands in a daze as the bus pulls away. After a long pause, Bob calls out. Dr. Marvin! Dr. Leo Marvin! Bob waits. Passerbys turn and stare. There's no Leo Marvin in sight. Dr. Marvin! Dr. Leo Marvin! Exterior general store. The Marvin family exits carrying groceries. They stop at the family station wagon and begin loading up. Dr. Leo Marvin! Dr. Leo Marvin! Leo, is someone calling you? I didn't hear anything. Leo Marvin! Dr. Leo Marvin! Over there. Everyone looks around. Sorry. Over Marvin there. turns to Bob. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I don't believe it. At the bus stop, Bob looks in all directions and suddenly sees Marvin. Dr. Marvin! It's you! Bob walks towards the Marvins. Marvin stands dumbfounded. He watches Bob walking towards them and he tries to stay calm. Everybody get in the car. Do you know that man, Leo? Dr. Marvin! It's me, Bob! Get in the car. Is surprised to see Leo is so forceful. She hustles the kids in the station wagon. Bob hurries up, out of breath. In one hand, he holds his bag. In the other, he holds Gil in a baggie. Don't forget about Gil. Marvin closes the station wagon door and stands outside. Hi, this is Gil. It must be fate that I found you so quickly. Bob stops and stands a little out of breath. Is this a bad time? What are you doing here? I, I thought you were dead. Oh, no. They told you. I fibbed a little, but don't be mad. Oh! A sweet, terrific smile appears on Bob's face, and he sighs. The fam! Marvin leads Bob away from the car <laughs> across the street. Exterior across the street from the parking lot, Marvin stops and faces Bob. I think you know, Bob, that your behavior is entirely inappropriate. We talked about trust. We talked about my needs. I want you to get on a bus and go back to New York. You're angry. I don't get angry. You're upset. I don't get upset. Then can't we just talk? I don't see patients on vacation, Bob, ever. How many ways can I make that clear? Well, you can't just send me away. I've read your book. I've been doing what you told me, but I've completely relapsed. A little time would mean so much, please. Bob, I'm driving away now, and I don't want you to bother me again. You came for my advice, correct? Absolutely. Then take my advice and go back to New York. But I can't go anywhere. I'm all locked up. Locked up. You got yourself here. Barely. Getting back will be therapeutic. Bob starts begging. Please, just talk to me. Just a little talk. You're testing my patience, Bob. Bob, Gary, please, give me, give me. I need, I need. A teeny tiny talk, a teeny tiny talk. Angle from the car, what the family sees. Bob is kneeling in front of Marvin. Pretty please, pretty please, with sugar, I need, I need. Give me, give me. Family exchanges quizzical looks. Back to Bob and Marvin. Marvin looks around, incredibly embarrassed. He tugs at the kneeling Bob. Get up, come on, get up. Say you will. Please, say you will. Marvin looks at his watch. Bob, it's two o'clock. Go to the bus station, buy a ticket home, then wait in that restaurant. He points to the Gutman's coffee shop. You'll meet me? I'll call you in two hours. Oh my god, you're the greatest. Bob moves to hug Marvin, and Marvin reluctantly lets him. But you must buy your ticket and give your word that you'll go home. This is all about trust again, Bob. We must have trust. I trust. I absolutely trust. I'll go buy my ticket right now. I'll call you at 4. You couldn't possibly make it 3.30, could you? Bob? 4 it is. 4 o'clock exactly. Thank you, Dr. M. Bob starts across the parking lot as Marvin gets in the car and closes the door. Interior Marvin family station wagon. As the car pulls out of the parking lot, Marvin's family turns to look at Bob. 
Bob smiles and waves at the family. Here, you look disturbed. I'm fine. Who was that poor man? Nobody. Anna's looking out the back window at Bob. She waves. He's cute. Anna thinks he's cute. Marvin hits the accelerator, leaving rubber. Interior Gutman's coffee shop later. An elderly couple tend to the cares and glasses. Bob paces by the phone, reading baby steps to himself. The clock on the wall reads three o'clock. Baby step to four o'clock. Baby step to four o'clock. Bob covers his eyes, then looks at the clock. No luck. Frustrated, Bob paces again. Baby, or I feel good. I feel great. I feel four o'clock. Again, he looks at the clock. 3.01. The elderly couple watch. They speak with thick European accents. Sonny, your fish is losing air. Huh? Huh? Yo, Bob looks at Gil. The baggie is dripping. Oh, thanks. Bob looks for something to do about the dripping baggie. Mr. Gutman brings a glass and dumps Gil in. Thank you. Is there something we can help you with? Can you make it four o'clock? Dr. Marvin's supposed to call me then, but I'm going crazy. Mm, not Dr. Leo Marvin. Do you know him? He bought our dream house. We worked a lifetime, saved up for a down payment. Then he swooped down with his fancy schmancy lawyers and grabbed it up from under us. Stay as far away from him as possible. Like the plague. No problem. I'm his patient, but he doesn't want me near him. We'll show you where he lives. Exterior Marvin's summer house. Marvin and Siggy march to the end of the Marvin dock. There's a diving board. Siggy stands in a black terry robe and flip-flops. Take off your robe. Everything you wear is black. I wish you'd get off this death fixation. Siggy reluctantly takes off his black robe. Under he wears a black t-shirt and black bathing suit. How do you know it's a death fixation? Maybe I'm in mourning for my lost childhood. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by asking? Come on, get on the board and let's see your approach. My approach is to be suave and debonair and sophisticated. Come on, Siggy. One, two, three, spring. Like we learned last time. One, two, three, spring. Siggy reluctantly mounts the board. He stands, feet together, then takes a step with his right foot. One, two, three, spring. One, two, three, summer. One, two, three, fall. Time to go, Dad. Cut it out, Siggy. Left foot. This is no fun. Siggy sighs and starts again. He awkwardly takes two steps, then stops at the end of the board, staring into the water, afraid to dive. Why didn't you dive? With all the horror that's going on in the world, what difference does it make? Interior Marvin Summer House. The decor is New England cottagey with a strong dose of Leo Marvin, incredibly ordered. On a pedestal is a bust of Sigmund Freud. On the mantle sits the family puppets, Anna, Siggy, Faye, and Leo. Anna is at the family stereo selecting a CD. Faye is at the cordless phone at the kitchen window giving milk to some stray cats. Of course I'm excited, Ellie. The last person they interviewed on the vacation was Dr. Ruth. Siggy enters and walks upstairs. Marvin follows and heads to the living room chair. Faye hangs up. He didn't die? No. He's a little afraid of it, dear. Have patience. It's not like I'm making him jump out of an airplane. When I was growing up, I thought diving was fun. I thought you were born grown up. Marvin stares at Anna. She puts on heavy metal. You're masking hostility, Anna Marvin. Turn that down. It's full of Freudian symbols, Dad. It's educational. Marvin turns down the volume, sits in his big easy chair, then takes a deep breath. He picks up Freud's understanding dreams. Anna puts on headphones and dances around wildly. Marvin tries to read. Suddenly, a face appears in the window. It's Bob. He sees Marvin and taps on the window. Marvin looks up and sees him. 
What are you doing here? Bob stands holding Gil in the glass and his bag. I'm sorry, don't be mad. The Gutmans brought me. Bob turns and waves at the Gutmans who are walking into an old trailer that occupies the next lot. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. G. You're welcome, Bobby. Hello, Dr. Marvin. Gutmans wave and Marvin waves back. Burn in hell, Dr. Marvin. Marvin's hand falls and the, <laughs> the Gutmans enter the trailer. Marvin turns to Bob. We agreed that I would call you. Your coming here is unbelievably inappropriate. Anna comes to the door. Hi. I'm Anna. I saw your picture. I'm Bob. Faye comes to the door. Hi, I'm Bob. I'm Faye. Oh, Mrs. M, you're even prettier than your picture. Why, thank you. Bob, I think you and I have some things to talk about. You do? You finally think so, too? Would you excuse us, dear? Bob, may I take your fish? Bob hands Gil to Faye, and she walks into the kitchen. Anna just stands there. Anna? Anna rolls her eyes and follows her mother. Nice to meet you, Bob. You too. Marvin leads Bob away. Bob sees the puppets on the mantel. Interior Marvin house study. Bob and Marvin enter the downstairs study, and Marvin indicates for Bob to take a seat. Great place. No wonder the Gutmans wanted it. I really feel bad about barging in like this. Forget it. I understand. You do? Of course I do. Your problems don't go away just because I go on vacation. They've been with you a long time, after all. Ever since I can remember. On the other hand, you're making strides. You got here. I baby stepped. I owe it to you. Bob smiles. Marvin stares at Bob for a long time, and then... Bob, take a look around you. What does everything you see have in common? Uh, I don't know. It's all owned by you, that's obvious. Um, everything's from a garage sale. There's a long pause, and Marvin stares at Bob. Vacation, Bob. Everything you see is part of a vacation. Every year, for one month, I bring my family to this house on vacation. Nice, isn't it? It's wonderful. The lake. The trees, the little town. Do you know what the point of a vacation is? Do you understand the meaning of the word? Sure. You forget about your troubles. You give up your worries. You drink from the wellspring of relaxation that enriches your soul. Now, I can't at this time give you the kind of therapeutic attention that you need to solve all of your problems. Know why? Uh, because you're on vacation. Excellent. But what I can do... And only I can do this because you trust me, don't you, Bob? Why else would I be here? Exactly. What I can do is this. Marvin goes to a drawer and pulls out a prescription pad. He writes. Get on your bus and go back to New York. Every time a problem comes up, follow this prescription. I don't need pills. I have plenty of pills. Marvin tears off a prescription sheet and hands it to Bob. It's not pills. Read it. It says a vacation for my problems. I'm giving you permission to take a vacation, Bob. Not a vacation from your work, not a vacation from your daily life, but a vacation from... My problems. Every time you feel a problem coming on, take that out and follow it to the letter, doctor's orders. Doctor's orders. I'm glad you came. Marvin stands. I'll see you in my office next month. That's it? You came here for relief, Bob. Read your prescription. Bob stands a moment looking at his prescription. This is incredible. This is astounding. For the first time since Meningers, I feel free. I knew coming up here was the right thing to do. It feels right because you're here, and it feels right because you're leaving. Bob comes over and hugs Marvin. You've given me a great gift, Doctor. The gift of life. You're a great man. Exterior, interior, Marvin house. Marvin opens the door for Bob. If you have any questions, call Dr. Harmon. Have a great vacation. Me too. Me too. A vacation from my problems. You bet I will. Bob exits and Marvin closes the door and looks up at the ceiling. He takes a deep breath, then turns back to the room. And there's a knock at the door. 
Yes. It's Bob. I forgot Gil. Marvin opens the door. My fish. Oh, right. Bob strides into the kitchen and takes his fish. Sigmund, now in his clothes, enters from upstairs. You must be Sigmund. Siggy, this is Bob. He's just leaving. Hi. Hi. This is Gil, my fish. Cool. Did you get him from the lake? No, he's a city fish. Cool. Your father is the most incredible psych psychiatrist in the world. You better appreciate him. He strides to the door and turns wistfully. Have a great vacation, fam. You too, Bob. Nice to meet you. Exterior wooded lane in Winnipesaukee. Bob walks down the country lane and crickets chirp. Vacation from my problems. Take a vacation from my problems. A baby stepping, lazy stepping, vacation from my problems. Bob falls into a rhythm, almost a little jig as he walks. Long dissolve to exterior Lake Winnipesaukee morning. Rooster's crow in the new day. Interior Marvin living room. Marvin, Faye, and Siggy stand frozen like artist models, staring at something. Is this suddenly a Goddard movie? Are we now in a Beckett play? Finally! It's too close to the wall. Yes! Marvin moves to the couch and pulls it out from the wall three inches. I care, and you should too. Our house is going on national television tomorrow. You want your friends to think you live in a dump? My friends would respect me for it. You know, there's nothing wrong with neatness. People joke, but it's actually a sign of creative intelligence. Right, Faye? In isolated cases, sure. What is that supposed to mean? The room looks wonderful, dear. Faye pecks him on the cheek and walks to the kitchen. Siggy follows. Ditto. Ditto Anna, who starts cooking pancakes. Uh, seriously, what do you mean by that? He gets no answer from the rest of the family who look at each other and smile. You're incredibly creative, Daddy. Marvin goes back to making minuscule adjustments, adjusting diplomas and so forth. At the front door is a knock. I'll get it. It's probably the van with my art. Checking out his set as he goes, Marvin opens the door. It's Bob. Good morning. I'll bet you're surprised to see me. Marvin stands dumbfounded. When I walked out of here last night, I said to myself, Dr. Marvin's absolutely right. Take a vacation from your problems. Blow them off. Just say no. So I did. But you're back. No, I'm not. You're not? Of course not. I'm taking a vacation. This isn't an appointment. I'm dropping by. I told the Gutmans what you said and they found me a cottage nearby. No. Yeah, the town is packed, but I guess if you know the right people. Anyway, I know we can't work, but let's get the friendship thing going. Marvin is absolutely flabbergasted. I'm a, I'm a little anxious about being here by myself, but I don't want to barge in. I'll call. Give my best to the fam and see you around, okay? Bob walks away and Marvin closes the door. He stands there for a long time. Ah, shoot. Uh, mm, who was that, Leo? Nobody. Again? There's a knock at the door and Marvin opens it. I almost forgot. Here's your newspaper. See ya. Marvin takes the newspaper and closes the door. Wasn't that Bob? There's another knock at the door. It's Bob. You guys up for going out to breakfast? No! Eating in. I admire that. Marvin slams the door in Bob's face. That was Bob. I thought you said he left town. I did. I said exactly that. 
Anna moves to the front door after Bob. Marvin grabs her arm and leads her to the kitchen. And I don't want you letting him in this house. Daddy, you're hurting me. Anna wrenches her arm away. What's your problem? I don't have a problem. Honey, who's that man? Nobody, Faye. Nothing you get excited about. A work-related problem just went away. It's fine. He strolls off to the kitchen and Anna rubs her arm. I've never seen him like this. If you want to know, I think your father is nervous about going on national television tomorrow. Freud himself would be anxious, so let's be supportive, okay? You should go punch some pillows. Or get shock treatment. Yes. Remember that he's under pressure. Flapjacks! Exterior wooded lane in Winnipesaukee. Bob walks down the empty country lane and crickets chirp. Vacation for my problems. Take a vacation from my problems. There's nothing to fear. There's nobody here. Nothing to fear. There's nobody here. <laughs> he starts running and screaming. Exterior Marvin's summhouse. Two men from the van are bringing the art in from Marvin's office. Marvin is using a weed trimmer to spruce up the shrubs to within an inch of their lives. Anna, in a bathing suit, sunglasses, and a skimpy cover-up, exits the house, gives her father a goodbye peck on the cheek, and gets the family station wagon. Where are you off to? Eileen. With Teddy Fiend? No. George Stark. The boy from the plane. It's a quarter mile to the marina. Why do you need the car? I'm picking everybody up. She starts the car and backs out. Stay out of the sun! Remember what's happening to the ozone layer. Exterior wooded lane in Winnipeg. Bob is running in a panic. Anna drives by and sees him. Bob! Anna hits the brakes and slows next to Bob. He breaks to a slow trot. Hi. Where are you going? Just to town. Buy some Kleenex. Want a ride? I don't think your dad would like you picking me up. He wouldn't like a lot of things. Hop in. Bob hesitates, but gets in. Interior Marvin station wagon. Anna drives and Bob puts on his seat. Oh. He seemed pretty upset this morning. He's nervous about the interview. Interview? Uh, Maurice Driver's coming tomorrow to talk about his book. Wow. So that's the problem. And I thought he was upset about me. Well, he's always uptight, even when it doesn't show. He is? Oh, sure. Imagine growing up with a dad who sees every stage of growing up as a Freudian passage. Did you ever have crayons? Sure. Fat or skinny? Uh, skinny, I think. Uh-oh. What, what do you mean? Dad saw crayons as phallic symbols. When I asked for skinny crayons, it was a personal assault on his manhood. What do you do, buy a Porsche? <laughs> I wish. He just kept psychoanalyzing everything. My dolls were alter egos. Boys who wanted to kiss me were edibly fixated adolescents looking to displace their mothers on their aboriginal family totems. Sounds like my friends to a T. <laughs> you seem to be doing okay now. Hardly. I analyze everything to death. Every time a guy smiles at me, I ask myself, is he really smiling or is he just orally fixated? And when I smile back, I wonder, am I really attracted or am I just smiling out of some residual Cro-Magnon instinct? If I ever actually have sex, I'm not sure I'll know the difference between an orgasm and an anxiety attack. I have the same problem. The kinds of urges other girls act on impulsively, I analyze until either the urge goes away or... Or what? Or what? The boy goes away. Long pause. Well, sounds like your dad never learned to leave his work at the office. Thought of good it does me. You'll make some man very happy someday. This hangs in the air and Anna looks at Bob. What are you doing today? Buying Kleenex. Wanna come sailing? Ooh, no, 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 no. 
Well, I, I, I... That's okay. You don't have to. Bob looks at Anna. He sees her attraction to him and it makes him nervous, but he doesn't want to reject her. He looks down shyly. Actually, it's not that I don't want to go. It's just that I've never been on a boat and I'm not sure I can handle it. it just kind of makes my lips numb just thinking about it. There's nothing to it. George Stark's doing the sailing. Just thinking about it gives me hides. Exterior George Stark's sailboat day. Close on Bob. Standing next to the mast, his hair blowing in the wind. You're right. This is great. I never actually thought I could do this. I never thought this could be me. I'm sailing. Pull back, Pull back to reveal that Bob, wearing life preservers on his body and legs, is wrapped onto the mast from chest to toe with ropes. Ahoy! Anna, George Stark from the airport, and a few other kids sit around <laughs> enjoying the sail. Exterior Marvin's private dock. Marvin stands at the end of the diving board, holding Siggy by his ankles out over the water. On the shore next door, the gutmen sit in the lounge chairs fishing. This is child abuse. If you drop me, I'll prosecute. I am not going to let go until you're ready, okay? Trust me and put your hands out like I showed you. I'm not ready. Do you hear? I'm not ready. George's sailboat heels by from uh, waves Anna and some of her friends and Bob. Hey, Dr. M, look at me. I'm sailing. I'm sailing. I'm a sailor now. Stunned, Marvin drops Siggy into the water and Siggy does a belly flop and then comes up for air. Prius. Murderer! Child molester. Siggy, it was an accident. Hitler. Exterior pier near Winnipesaukee Town later. Marvin walks along the shore towards the pier in time to see Anna and Wobbly Bob disembark George's sailboat. Anna. Anna sees her father. She says goodbye to George and her friends and walks towards her father. Bob starts towards Marvin, too. Did you see me out there? I'm getting better all the time. I want to see Anna alone. Bob stops. Marvin waits a while Anna walks to him. I thought I told you to stay away from Bob Wiley. No, you just said I couldn't let him in the house. Marvin starts walking away from the sailboating party towards the town green. He puts his arm around Anna so that she has to walk with him. Daddy, where are we going? Home. What about the car? I left it at the pier. Leave it. It's been a while since I've had a walk with my daughter. Anna looks back at her friends and Bob. She shrugs and turns back to her father. From his pockets, Marvin removes Leo and Anna puppets and her hands her Anna. Daddy, not here! Anna, I know you think you're old enough to know what's best for you, and I know you're at the age where you don't want to listen to your father. But as your father, who's always loved you, I'm asking you not to see Bob Wiley. Anna grabs the Anna puppet and puts it on defiantly. I don't understand the problem. Bob's a nice guy. Bob Wiley is a patient. He followed me here from New York, which is bizarre. But even if it weren't bizarre, my daughter seeing a patient that I'm treating is entirely inappropriate. Bob said you're not treating him here. He's right there. So if you're not treating him while he's here, then he's not a patient while he's here. Is he? I have the right to see him. She throws the puppet at Marvin and then runs to her friends. Anna, you're acting out. Bob's a perfectly nice guy. He's intense and sensitive and he listens, which is more than I can say about you. Bob! Marvin stands a moment and watches. He's stunned. Anna, come back. Anna runs to Bob and takes his arm. They start walking down the shore and Marvin is dumbstruck. All right, that's interior, exterior, Marvin house later. Siggy lies on the dock looking up at the sky through binoculars. Faye's in the kitchen arranging driftwood. She comes to the back door of the cottage. Why don't you come in and talk about it? Siggy says nothing. Just because your father dropped you in the water doesn't mean you can't trust me. You sleep with him. You're his spy. Interior front door of the Marvin house. Marvin enters looking absolutely stunned. 
Leo, you're ups you ups uh, you've upset Siggy. Marvin stares blankly at Faye, then shuffles up the stairs. Leo? Again, Marvin doesn't answer, and Faye starts towards him. That's right, go to him. You always do. <laughs> Faye stops, looks at Siggy, then goes upstairs after Leo. Exterior, the dock. Siggy lies back down and peers through the binoculars. As he does, a grotesque close-up of Bob pops, pops into his field of view. He sits up with a start. Bob and Anna are standing over him. Hey, Siggy. Oh, hi, Bob. You scared me. Sorry, I didn't mean to sneak up on you. Siggy lies back down and looks through the binoculars, clearly not interested in being social. Bob looks at Anna and she shakes her head. That's at it again. I can tell. Another vacation that's not a vacation, right? What's with him and diving? Maria Shriver's not going to watch me dive. Interior Marvin house bedroom. Marvin is prostrate on the bed. Marvin puppet still in his hand, staring at the ceiling. Faye enters. She sits down next to him and strokes his hair. Leo, Sticky's really upset. Marvin says nothing. Leo? Marvin looks to his wife. Faye, I'm a failure. What? Our daughter, our only daughter, has fallen for a brilliant manipulator twice her age. Leo, for God's sake, talk sense. Anna and Bob. Exterior the Marvin private dock. Siggy is standing on the diving board, ready for his approach. Bob and Anna watch from the pier. Next door, the Gutman sit watching. Face of fear, and it goes away. Okay, I'm facing it. Now what do I do? Hit it, fast, while it isn't looking. Siggy takes a deep breath, summons up his courage, and takes his approach. He springs, but can't dive. My mind says yes, yes, but my body says no, no. It's hopeless. If I'm not hopeless, nothing's hopeless. Bob steps onto the board. He baby steps out to where Siggy is standing. Let's try something I saw in a pirate movie. Let's try something I saw in a pirate Interior movie. Interior Marvin bedroom. Marvin is in the hall in the bathroom, dousing his face with water. Faye stands in the bedroom. For God's sakes, I'm even a failure in my own book. Can you believe it? In chapter two, I wrote that a healthy adolescent girl can never have the sublimated father complex, and my daughter has one. It's a brief flirtation, honey, and is perfectly healthy. Then you're saying the book's wrong? Better than that, Anna. Marvin washes his face some more than looks up. Hey, my God. Marvin walks into the room, water dripping off his face, looking like a man who's just seen his own death. Leo, what? Leo, what is it? I'm going on national television tomorrow to promote a fraud. Exterior Marvin private dock. Bob is standing near the edge of the di diving board, holding Siggy by the hips. Siggy is hanging over the water, hands head down, ready to enter the water diving. Anna is watching, and so are the Gutmans. Don't think about boiling oil. I'm not. Or searing acid. I'm not. Our father, we commit this soul to the sea. Bob gently releases Siggy, and Siggy falls into the water, diving. Anna applauds. So do the Gutmans. Siggy resurfaces and throws a jubilant fist into the air, a la Breakfast Club. Yeah. <laughs> Into the Marvin bedroom. Faye holds Marvin's head in her uh, bosom, stroking him. I'm doomed. No, you're not. I'll be a laughing stock. No, you won't. You blow this way out of proportion, Leo, and you have to get control. Now try your breathing. Okay. I'm being ridiculous. <gasps> you're right. He walks around breathing exaggeratedly. It's, it's a brilliant book. Our daughter's fine. I'm great. That's right. Applause from outside can be heard in the room, and Faye goes to the window. Faye, do you remember a Carswell Finsterwald? 
My God, Leo, look at this. The name is so familiar, but... Leo, Sticky's diving. What? Marvin looks out the window and he sees exterior Marvin private dock, Marvin's point of view. Bob releases Siggy for another perfect dive. Back to Marvin. I'll put a stop to this. Marvin storms out of the bedroom. Leo! Exterior Marvin dock. Siggy stands at the end of the board, more confident now, getting ready to do another dive. Bob holds Siggy again, but this time Siggy doesn't need much help, if any. Marvin charges down the dock, Faye right behind him. Enough! Let go of him, that's enough. Leo! Dr. M, watch this. Watch, Dad! Stop diving this instant. Dad! Marvin leaps onto the diving board, shaking it. Bob loses his grip and Siggy falls off the board, doing a backbuster. Bob falls in, too. Ow! You bastard! <laughs> Leo, look at what you're doing. Leo, look at yourself. Everybody looks at Marvin, standing alone on the board. He realizes he's lost all control, something he never does. He looks at the Gutmans. What are you staring at? I had every right to buy this house. Where's Bob? Where's Bob? Anna and Faye dive into the water and they go under looking for Bob. Exterior Marvin House deck, afternoon. Bob is off a bit by himself, wringing out his clothes. Faye, Anna, and Siggy sit toweling off. Marvin comes out of the house and talks in low tones to his family. Listen, everybody, I'm... Not wrong often, but when I am, I admit it. I'm sorry. I mean it. How can I make it up? There is a pause. Anna and Siggy and Faye look at each other. Knocking Bob in the water was awful. What if he hadn't known how to swim? But he did. I'm not saying I was right, but Bob could do a lot of things no one thought he could do. Anna, Faye, and Siggy are silent. Look, I said I was wrong. Now I'd like to forget it. I'd like you all to accept my apology. What about Bob? What about Bob? Don't you think you should apologize to him? Angle on Bob. At the outdoor shower, rinsing off his clothes, he can't hear the family, but he can see they're talking about him, and he's giving his best hangdog look. I will not apologize to Bob. Why not? Because I won't. Honey, why are you so hostile toward the poor man? Because he's a patient, Faye. Don't you get it? He's not a patient. He's a person. And a nice one. I think we should invite him for dinner. Dinner? Dinner. Really? <gasps> the poor fellow's devastated. Faye heads towards Bob. Marvin turns to her. He keeps his voice low to keep from being heard by Bob, but inside he's about to explode. I don't want Bob for dinner, Faye. Leo. I don't want Bob for dinner, Faye. I want to think about my interview. Leo is trying not to explode, and Faye hangs in the balance. Do it, Mom, and fight him. You'd be making family history. It'd be the first major thing you've done on your own since I've known you. Why is right, Leo Marvin? Faye heads to Bob, and Marvin's mouth falls open. Testing. One, two, three, testing. For the next few seconds, we'll be conducting a test of the emergency broadcast system. Marvin Siggy. Faye talks to Bob's. Anna heads over to him, too. Marvin stands speechless, ready to commit Harry Carey. Exterior Marvin House patio, evening. Dusk has descended over Lake Winnipesaukee. The glow of the moon, the stars, and the lights from other cottages along the lakeshore provide peaceful illumination. The Marvin family, and Bob, are dining out in their deck overlooking the lake. Marvin sits silent, holding his anger. Bob, swinging at occasional moths, sits next to Siggy. Get away! Get away! Bring around the moon. Rain coming soon. Gee, is that true? It's superstitious nonsense. Anna and Faye exit the cottage carrying trays of food. Oh, that looks scrumptious. Anna smiles and hands the first plate of food to Bob. Marvin sees this and crosses his arms. He shoots a death stare at Anna. She defiantly shoots it right back. Bob sees this exchange of looks. Did I do something? No, Bob, it's fine. Eat up, Leo. Faye looks at Marvin and shakes her head, no. 
Mmm. 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 This sure is good. Mmm. 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 Would you please stop that? Mm. Sorry, Leo. Would you pass the salt? And don't call me Leo. I'm sorry. You said in your office that I could call you Leo. That was in my office. In my home, you will call me Dr. Marvin. Marvin snaps the salt down next to Bob. Bob looks helplessly at Faye, and Faye puts a hand on Bob's arm. He's nervous about the interview tomorrow. Don't take it personally. Hey, that's right. I heard about your upcoming debut. Congratulations. Marvin nods and eats. Bob throws salt over his shoulder, then salts his food. Your book's going to do a lot of people a lot of good, Leo. Dr. Marvin, I'm walking proof of that. Marvin chokes on the food he's eating. Siggy slaps his dad on the back and Marvin keeps coughing. Yep. <laughs> Marvin turns red and points to his throat. He falls to the deck on his side and Bob stands. Don't panic, I know what to do. Bob hurries to Marvin, lies beside him, and administers the Heimlich maneuver. On the second try, Marvin's throat clears. Marvin lies in Bob's arms, coughing. Yeah, you okay? Daddy! <laughs> Honey? Marvin says something. Faye leans over him to hear. Leo, are you okay? I said get him off me! Bob lets go of Marvin, and Marvin coughs and crawls away. <laughs> oh, you saved him. Incredible! Oh my God, wonderful! Thank you. Bay helps Marvin get to his feet. Suddenly, there's a flash of lightning. Bob jumps. Rain begins to fall. Marvin looks up. Told you so. Interior Marvin house. The rain outside is coming down in buckets. Marvin is in the living room, re-straightening the furniture and art ever so meticulously. He adjusts a diploma over the mantel. Anna, Faye, Siggy, and Bob are in the kitchen doing the dishes. I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. What a glorious feeling. Bob throws a pack of Kleenex to the trash. I'm happy again. Bob retrieves the pack of Kleenex from the trash. I walk through the kitchen with a bowl full of chicken, putting it in Dr. Mar Leo, I mean Marvin's refrigerator. I'm singing in the rain. Anna and Faye and Siggy start to dance. Marvin enters. Uh, look, uh, look, tomorrow morning look. is very important, and I'd like to call it a night. I don't want to be rude, but I, I think it's time, rude, for, Bob it's time for Bob to sing his way home. Honey, don't you expect Bob to walk past me? Did I say that? I'll drive him. Uh, the car's still in town, Daddy. What? You said leave it, remember? We walked home. Marvin sees, then looks darkly at Anna. The rain's bound to let up. Bob can go then. What if it starts up again while Bob's on the way? He can borrow my slicker! Interior Marvin living room, late night. Marvin stands staring out the window like he'd like to murder the rain that's still coming down the tor in torrents. Bob is on the couch, sitting alone wearing Marvin's yellow slicker, looking unwanted. Anna, Siggy, and Faye sit quietly, watching Marvin. Bob looks at Faye and shrugs like he's sorry. Faye puts a sympathetic hand on Bob's. Leo. Shh. Leo. Quiet, it's lighting up. There's a crash of thunder that shakes the rafters. Marvin reaches out and slowly scratches the window, creating a tiny squeaking sound. Faye walks to him. Leo, we can't make the poor fellow sit here all night. Let him stay over. Stay over? Honey, Maria Shriver's coming in the morning. Maria Shriver? You want some guy sleeping on our couch when Maria Shriver gets here? There's an extra bed in Siggy's room, Bob. Would you like to spend the night? Well, I... Do you have a Decron pillow? That's a great idea. Hey! Are you sure I'm not imposing? Of course you are. 
aren't, Anna. Find an extra set of sheets. Siggy, get one of your father's robes for Bob. Faye shoots Marvin a dirty look, then exits the room with Anna. Marvin claws the window, making a bone-chilling squeak. Interior, Siggy's room. Siggy's room has twin beds right ahead against the corner. Bob, wearing one of Marvin's robes, enters. Siggy is hanging up his clothes. Do you find a toothbrush? Yeah. Uh, excuse me. You care which bed? I prefer facing southeast. Interior, Marvin's bedroom. Marvin enters in his PJs and Faye is preparing for bed. Have you seen my new toothbrush? It should be in the bathroom. Well, it should be in the bathroom, honey, but it's not in the bathroom. <laughs> Faye shoots Marvin a dirty look, then heads towards the bathroom. Just because you're nervous about tomorrow, Leo Marvin, doesn't give you the right to get snippy. If you can't handle the pressure, postpone the interview. Hey, it's not the interview. I mean, I am nervous about it, but that's not what's bugging me. It's him. Him who? Bob? No, Siggy. Yes, Bob. Who else? Leo, quiet. He'll hear you. Why shouldn't he hear me? Don't you get it? He's a sick person. A multiphobic, messy, fake suicide. Isn't that a cry for help? Followed me up here from New York, wormed his way into my house. For all I know, he, he's, he's a mass murderer. Oh, come on, Leo. He's a sweet guy, perfectly harmless. You don't know that. Everything he's done violates the patient-doctor relationship. And now he's an heir with our son. Interior, Siggy's bedroom. Bob and Siggy lie in Siggy's twin beds. Outside, lightning flashes and Bob chews his nails. Bob? Yeah? How come you go to dad? Are you really sick? Or just maladjusted? Sick. You ever had a bee buzz your face that wouldn't go crazy? Or that it wouldn't go away? Sure. Once or twice. When I was 12, I had one buzz me for three weeks. Lightning strikes again. Bob bites his nails and stands and paces a bit. He notices some books in Siggy's bookcase. Whoa. You got some heavy stuff here. Denial of death, fear and trembling, sickness unto death. Those are dads. He lets you read this stuff? He hid them, but I found them. Bob looks in one, shudders, then puts it back on the shelf. Bob? Yeah? Are you afraid of death? Sure. Are you kidding? What do you do about it? I mean, how do you cope? Well... The way I figure it, if if it weren't called death, it wouldn't be so bad. I mean, what if it were called dink? Dink? Then it would be fine. We'd say Grandma dinked. The garbage man dinked. My turtle just dinked. Exactly. Then we wouldn't worry anymore. Hey, you're right. Of course, we'd still have to worry about Barrett's, esoph Barrett's esophagus and blackwater fever and Tourette's syndrome. What's Tourette's syndrome? Interior Faye in Marvin's bedroom. Faye and Leo lie near sleep. Suddenly, from the other room comes a loud barrage of profanity. Fart brain! Bugger head! Doggy dick! Faye and Marvin spring out of bed. Interior Siggy's room. Bob and Siggy are jumping up and down on their beds, spouting profanity at each other. Marvin and Faye rush in. What is going on in here? Bob and Siggy jump under the covers. Sorry, Dad. Sorry. I asked you a question. Uh, Tourette's, Dad, you know. You know, Dad? Yeah, Dad. Leo. Talk to Marvin. Marvin glares at Bob, and Faye nudges Marvin. It's kids being kids, Leo. I don't want to hear another peep out of this room. I'm trying to get some sleep around here. Tomorrow is the most important day of my career. CBS is coming here. Maria Shriver is coming here. Millions will be watching and buying. Sorry, Dad. We'll stop. We got carried away. We won't do it again. Marvin stares at Bob. I want you out by 6.30, understand? Maria Shriver comes at 7. I want you out by 6.30. Sure. Would you like anything for sleep? What? I've got Valium if you need it. No, I don't need any Valium. Halcyon, second all. I want peace and quiet. Well, I'll be quiet. 
I'll be peace. Bob nudges <laughs> Ziggy, and they try to contain their laughter. Marvin glares at them and then storms out. Faye comes up and tucks them in their beds. It's my fault, Mrs. M. We should have been quieter. We just have to get him to a shy with Sleep tight. Don't let the bu bugs bite. Bed bugs? It's just an expression. Oh, right. Night. She turns out the light and pulls the door closed. Mrs. M. Faye opens the door. Would you mind leaving it cracked? Faye smiles and leaves the door cracked. Exterior long shot of Lake Winnipesaukee early morning. A clearing storm right after the dawn, three vans from CBS Morning wind along the lake towards town. Exterior second story of the Marvin house. Through the window, we see Siggy and Bob sound asleep in their beds. Dolly across the clapboards to Leo and Faye's room where Faye lies sound asleep and Marvin lies looking at his watch. It lets out a series of beeps and he stands and exits. Dolly back to Siggy's room where Marvin knocks loudly. Six o'clock, rise and shine. Siggy sits up. Bob doesn't stir. Marvin enters, watch beeping, and walks to Bob. He puts the watch next to Bob's ear. Rise and shine, six o'clock. Rise and shine, rise and shine. Bob doesn't move. Faye and Anna enter in robes. Bob. Bob. He's shaking Bob's bed. Bob. Bob. Get up. Bob sits Bob. through incredible shaking, yelling from desperate Marvin, then suddenly sits up with a start. Ah. Everybody leaps back. Interior, Marvin household. Marvin is in the living room, dressed in the stiffest casuals from L.L. Bean, nervously adjusting his set. Faye in the kitchen, prepping food. Momentarily, Bob comes in, bounding down the stairs. Baby stepping down the stairs, baby stepping down the stairs. He turns and sees Marvin. Hello. Is this a beautiful day or what? Marvin walks to Bob. Leave. I had the most incredible dream last night. I... Oh. <clears throat> Is this something you want, want me to work out on my own? Now. Well, you've been right about everything so far. God, therapy is a fascinating process. Bye, Mrs. M. Thank you for everything. Bye, Anna. See you, see you later. Bye, Bob. See you later today, maybe. Don't be a stranger. You know me. I won't. So long, ass wipe of the universe. Bye, dog pissing barf brain. Siggy, Bob. Bob exits out the front door. Later, fart smelling douchebag. Maria Shriver's here. <laughs> Marvin turns red in the face, walks to the door. Exterior, interior, Marvin House doorway. Maria Shriver in her entourage. Producer, director, video crew approach the door. Dr. Marvin, Maria Shriver. Hello. I hope we're not too early. May we come in? Marvin steps aside. The crew enters with equipment. Uh, sure, I thought by the fireplace. It's a fireplace shot, fellows. Yeah. <laughs> Interior Marvin's summer house. Bob walks to the side screen door, pushes his nose to it, and watches. Marvin sees this and motions Bob away with his hand. Bob waves back. Two men approach Marvin. I'm the director, Howie Cutreau. This is Lenny Burns, our producer. Marvin shakes their hands. Maria admires the house. This is even nicer than the pictures. Thank you. Is this your family? Yes. Oh, sorry. This is my wife, Afei, my daughter, Anna, and my son. Marvin is so nervous, he's forgotten Siggy's name. I'm, I'm Siggy, Dad. Uh, how, how's Arnold? Can you give me his autograph? Sigmund? I think I can swing it. Really? Wow. Maria looks at Bob, who is still standing in the screen door. Hi, I'm Maria. I'm Bob. He opens the screen door and shakes her hand. This done, Marvin closes the screen door on Bob. Uh, Bob's a patient. He was just... Wow, a baby step in action. Neat idea, Howard. Dr. Marvin, gonna have a patient on with him. Fine, let's... let's can, can the fireplace shot and... Now, now, wait just a minute. 
That, that's okay. We, we still use the fireplace. Phil, what we say we set up over there and, and you know. And... Bob opens the screen door and walks back in. Marvin sees this and can't believe it. Miss Schreiber. You know, the more I think about this, Doctor, the more I love it. I mean, who better to testify to the effectiveness of your book than one of your patients? I think it's a two-parter, Lenny. I do, too. Great idea, Dr. Marvin. Terrific. He slaps the disbelieving Marvin on the back. Interior Marvin living room. The room is bright lit for TV. Oh, no. What page are we on? It just glows on me. Uh, yeah. Bottom of 97 in the PDF, yeah. What Dr. Thank Marvin you. said. You Interior said Marvin living room. The room is bright lit for TV and the crew is making last minute adjustments. Marvin and Bob sit on the couch, both nervous wrecks. Bob clutching his copy of Baby Steps in the air sickness bag. Marvin clutching a copy of his book. Marvin's diplomas and art are displayed prominently on the set. The proud family looks on. Faye leans in with a lint roller, rolls Marvin's shirt, kisses him, and backs out. Live feed in 10. Knock him dead, honey. A crew person rushes up and takes down Marvin's diploma. Five, four. Can I use the bathroom? Howie points at Maria. Good morning. We're live in the beautiful lake. I'm going to say this one. What's happening? What I'm sorry. Of Dr. Leo M. Marvin, author of the newest sensation in therapy, Baby Steps. Also with us is Dr. Marvin's patient, Bob Wiley. Good morning, Dr. Marvin. Bob? Good morning. Good morning. Marvin shoots Bob a dirty look. Bob smiles innocently. Suddenly, Bob takes out his air sickness bag and holds it out as if throwing up in it. After a long beat, Bob puts it back. False alarm. Sorry. Bob smiles and Marvin turns beet red. Dr. Marvin, it takes a remarkable amount of confidence in your methods to bring out a, on a patient with you. What in particular about Bob's prior conditions would you like to share with us? Marvin looks at Bob. A tiny, sadistic smile comes across his face. There are a million things he'd like to say about Bob to humiliate him, punish him, discredit him, ridicule him, vilify him, pillory him on national TV. Nothing. Nothing? Nothing in particular you can think we should know? No. Hmm. Well, let me try you, Bob. She smiles at Bob. Bob takes out his air sickness bag again. He holds it out for a long time and puts it away. He smiles. Okay. Have you been a patient of... Have you been a patient of Dr. Marvin for a long time? Long time? I wouldn't call it a long time. What? Three or four days? Days? Interior, a dinging room in downtown urban sprawl. Carswell Finsterwald sits watching Marvin and Bob on TV. Marvin is a bumbling wreck, trying to save this one. Well, well you see, I was, he was, I was uh, follow, following his case through a, another psychiatrist. He thought I was uh, the perfect doctor for the case because of my book. Oh. Why, you sly dogs, he was right. I wanted to say that if more wisdom or, or more empathy or more pure intelligence exists and exits in this man, I want to know about it. You know that he actually had me sleep here last night in his jammies using his toothbrush? That's a very unusual technique. Finster Wall pounds on his chair and howls with glee. Back to Marvin's house living room. Well, I'll say, and I've been to the mall. Doctors who made you beat pillows. Demonstrates by beating a couch pillow. Doctors who make you scream. Ah! Bob suddenly screams and Marvin jumps. But this doctor has something simple. Baby steps. Bob holds up baby steps, then stands and walks back and forth in front of Marvin. He holds the book so that it can be seen by the TV camera. Baby step across the room. Baby step across the room. 
He leans in and looks into the camera. Are you getting the book? Bob plops back on the couch. Let me tell you what I used to be like before I met Dr. M. Bob puts his arm around Marvin. Eleven years ago, I was not the man you see today. Eleven years ago... Dissolve 2, exterior Marvin house morning. CBS vans are loading up. Maria, Lenny, and Howie stand at the door saying goodbye. Marvin hovers in the background in shock. Bob, that stuff about yourself was refreshingly honest. Could we talk to you again in a few months to update your progress? Sure, as long as my doctor gives permission. Marvin tries to force a smile, but can't. A CBS staff photographer comes over, places Bob and Maria in his frame, and snaps a picture. The CBS people head off. Thank you for your hospitality, Miss Marvin. Anytime. Maria and CBS leave. Interior Marvin House living room. The family and Bob move back into house, looking like a zombie. Leo closes the door. He stands still for a long moment. I'm ruined. Ruined? My career. Everything I've worked for. Over. Marvin ambles across the room like a cripple. The family watches in shock. But Daddy! Suddenly, Marvin turns on Bob. Get out. Is this something I said? Marvin moves at Bob, backing him towards the front door. Get out! Seeing Marvin's rage, Bob backs out and Marvin closes the door. After a moment, there's a knock. Marvin opens it. Is this aversion therapy? Go away, now! Okay. Marvin slams the door again. The family is stunned. My god, Leo, what got into you? Dad, you're overreacting. What about Bob? Exterior Chris Craft boat. The doctors in their waves still uh, sit wrapped, listening to Doctor Three. Yeah, but... What about Bob? What about Bob? In the Marvin House living room. What about Bob? Dad! Daddy, look at your behavior! What are you doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? He strides across the room, finds his electronic organizer, opens it, and pushes some buttons. Wednesday afternoon. He holds out the organizer for the family to see the readout. I'm going sailing! Exterior country road. Bob walks down the road upset, talking to himself. Fam is hurt. I've hurt them. I didn't mean to. Certainly they realize that. I've, I've hurt the fam. Hurt the fam! I've hurt the fam. The Marvin station wagon, Marvin driving, passes. Bob sees Faye, Siggy, and Anna turn and wave. Hi, fam! Bye, fam. The car speeds on. I heard the fam. Exterior, Winnis Pisaki Pier. Marvin's family climbs aboard the small sailboat. Marvin pulls a line under the deck and the boat glides out onto the lake. Exterior, Winnipesaukee Town, filled with vac vacationers. Bob wanders, looking lost and mumbling. I could apologize, but then I'd have to go back and I'm not sure they want me. I heard the fam. That much I know. Hurt the fam. Hot dog bun. Bob looks idly up. A vendor with a cart is talking to Bob. Sure. The vendor hands Bob a hot dog and Bob hands him money and wanders off. New angle, a busy green beside the pier. Families of tourists stroll. Bob stands staring dejectedly out at the lake. Unthinkingly, he takes a bite of the hot dog and turns. This has to be some kind of test. I know I hurt them, but they have to know I didn't mean it. If it's a test, I ate a hot dog. Bob stares at the hot dog like it just spoke Greek. I ate a hot dog. The tourists turn and stare. Exterior Lake Winnipesaukee. Marvin stands at the helm, sailing in the small sailboat across the lake. The breeze blows Marvin's hair, making him look wild. Anna stuns. Siggy casts a fishing line. Faye stares into nowhere. I mean, it's summertime, right? What could their audience be? Five million? Most of them hardly pay attention anyway, right? The point is, the book got on. It couldn't hurt sales that much, could it? Of course not. I mean, it's a disaster, Faye! Honey? Hey, look! Isn't that Bob? Off the bow, a small motorboat is approaching. Angle on the motorboat. 
Bob is steering a small motorboat towards the sailboat. He holds half of his hot dog out like a trophy. Dr. M. Dr. M, I've had a breakthrough. I ate a hot dog. I'm driving a boat, thanks to you. Angle in the sailboat. It is Bob. It's Bob. Oh, no. Hey, Bob. Anna and Siggy wave, Marvin's eyes narrow. Bob keeps shouting as he motors closer. I'm really making progress now. I feel like a whole new world is opening up. He keeps getting closer. My childhood memories are rushing over me like a flood. Marvin turns the rudder and comes about. Coming about. He turns the sailboat and heads opposite direction from Bob. Uh, Daddy, what are you doing? Go away. What? Daddy, he's trying to talk to you. Dad. Marvin keeps sailing away, but Bob's boat is faster and it's gaining. Marvin sees this, jerks the rudder again, turns 90 degrees. He stands and shouts at Bob. Go away. Do you hear me? Leo, the boom! The boom hits Marvin square in the chest and knocks him overboard. Daddy! Leo! Leo! Daddy! <laughs> Exterior yeah. water, lake level. <laughs> Marvin bobs in the water. The pilotless sailboat heels away. Bob dives in, swims to Marvin, and grabs him by the chin in traditional lifesaver hold. As Siggy gains control of the sailboat, Bob begins doing the side stroke towards the shore with Marvin in tow. I never had a father, really. Dad left one morning and never came back. My earliest memory is Mom with a suitcase. Do you think that's significant? Marvin is a prisoner in tow. He drags himself underwater. Bob pulls him up and keeps swimming. I'd like to do some free association about my infancy. A beach ball, a dog, a frog, a log. Foodle, noodle, doodle. <laughs> As Bob swims, Marvin shorts the shore, going on and on with this insane free association. Dissolve to exterior Marvin house afternoon. Marvin dry and dressed now, exits the house and gets in the station wagon. He honks. Momentarily, Bob runs out. Will do. Bob gets in the car, effectless. Marvin stares at him. Wherever we're going, Faye wants us home by seven. No problem. Marvin accelerates away, rudely. Interior, exterior, Marvin station wagon. Rain is falling, the wipers swish. Marvin drives through pastoral New Hampshire countryside, focused, perhaps intently, too intently, on the road. Bob still be beside him. It's a combustible relationship, isn't it? Is it just you and me, or is it you and everybody? So what's the big surprise? Intensive psychotherapy. Really? Isn't that what you came here for? Yeah, but what brought you? What brought this on now? You're ready. Wow, this is exciting. Exterior of the Tomsky convalescent home. Rain is let up. Marvin pulls up to the gated estate, sporting expansive grounds and a hotel-sized main building. Marvin stops at the guard gate. Leo Marvin, is he Dr. Tomsky? The gate guard checks a list. He waves Martin through. Gate guard main building doctor. They're expecting you. Where are we? Therapy land, Bob. A 20th century theme park of the mind. They drive. The lines look short today. Exterior of the Tomsky convalescent home. Marvin gets out and so does Bob. A man Leo's age, Dr. Tomsky approaches. Hello, Leo. Long time no see. Is this our friend? Bob Wiley, this is your new pal, Dr. Tomsky. New pal? What's wrong with my old pal? Tomsky makes a motion on his head. Two big attendants move to either side of Bob. Let us show you to your room. They lead Bob off. Hey, don't touch me. I, I have seizures. Dr. M. Dr. M. <laughs> they take Bob into a building and Marvin turns to Tomsky. Ah, I really appreciate you helping me out on this, Kenneth. Tomsky holds out a form to, for Marvin to sign, and he does. 
I can only hold him for 24 hours, Leo, without staff corroboration. <laughs> I'm not worried in the least, Kenneth. I'm sure your entire staff will corroborate. With intensive treatment, he should be out in about 50 years. Marvin hands the clipboard back to Tomsky and they shake. Exterior Marvin House driveway late afternoon. Marvin's station wagon pulls into the driveway. The radio is blasting, playing a tape of Neil Diamond. Marvin exits it, dancing as he sings along. I'll be what I am, solitary man, solitary man. Interior Marvin's summer house. Marvin enters singing. Siggy and Anna see him. Uh, Dad? Okay, yeah. anime, Leo Marvin's okay. Leo Marvin, he's okay. Where's Bob? Yeah, Dad, where's Bob? Can a man enjoy himself on vacation? Dad? Bob sends his regrets, but he had to take a trip. What kind of trip? I thought you were working with him. I was. Then why'd he go on a trip? Why does a man climb a mountain, Anna? Because it's there. Our friend turns up the music and dances. Anna and Siggy stand, stunned. He didn't even say goodbye. Left? It's not like Bob not to say goodbye. That's why he left. You see, he just wasn't himself. All right. Dad, if you did something to Bob... Anna, what do you take me for? Everything's fine. Marvin, looking perfectly content, turns off the music, goes to his chair, picks up Freud's Understanding Dreams, the book he's been trying to read since he arrived here. Siggy and Anna stare at him suspiciously. Faye enters carrying the cordless phone. Leo, a Dr. Tomsky says it's urgent. Marvin takes the phone and walks into the kitchen. Anna and Siggy look over more suspicious. Momentarily, Leo strides out of the kitchen and walks out the front door. Leo, where are you going? Out. Just like that? Be home by seven, okay? Marvin doesn't answer because he's gone. Something's rotten in Winnipesaukee. Exterior of the Tomsky Convalescent Home. Marvin's car screeches up. Marvin hurries out. Interior Tomsky Convalescent Home. Bob sits around a table with Tomsky and several of her other members of the staff who are laughing. Wait, I, I have another one. Who knows the difference between Freud and Moses? He sees blank, expectant faces waiting for a punchline. Well, if you don't know, I'm going to, going to another clinic. <laughs> <laughs> they all laugh. Tomsky sees Marvin enter in Sands. Excuse me. So a psychiatrist and a psychologist go into a bar and order Bloody Marys. Interior Tomsky Convalescent Home hallway. Tomsky joins Marvin in the hall, the other room we see Bob continuing the joke with the staff. Kenneth, you have been duped by a textbook narcissist, a brilliant neuropath. Brilliant enough to dupe my entire staff? I doubt that. Tomsky stuffs the paper into Marvin's shirt pocket. I'm giving you back his admitting forms, Leo, to save you the embarrassment. Embarrassment? It's perfectly natural for a patient to bond with his analyst. It's a normal part of therapy. If you want to be rid of him, simply take him back where you got him and go home. That's easy for you to say. He, he, he's human crazy glue. If it were that simple, do you think I'd be here? You should have never let him sleep in your pajamas, Leo. His problems don't go away just because you want them to. Whose side are you on? Relax, Leo. I'm relaxed. Take a vacation. I'm on vacation! Are you sure? Maybe you should check in here for a few days and get a handle on things. Marvin looks at Tomsky, amazed at the implication of this statement. Exterior countryside of New England. Marvin drives. Bob rides. Marvin looks ready to explode. Intensive psychotherapy? Boy, you weren't kidding, were you? I mean, Dr. T didn't think I needed that. Look, I have an idea. How are your afternoons? I mean, since we're t here together with nothing else to do, let's say we work from two to four or something like that. Exterior Country Road. The Marvin Mobile screeches to a halt and Marvin jumps out. He rushes around the car and opens Bob's door. Ah! 
Get out of my car, get out of my life, don't ever come back. Marvin drags Bob out of the car and slams the door. Are you saying you'd prefer mornings? Marvin gets back in and floors it. He speeds off. What is this? Isolation therapy? Bob stands alone in the road. You're the doctor. Birds chirp and crickets crick. A pickup truck passes and Bob sticks out his thumb. The pickup stops. Interior Marvin's car. Marvin is about to bust a vessel. Telephone poles shoot by like pickets on a fence. Behind him, a siren wails. In his rearview mirror, Marvin sees a motorcycle cop approaching. No, he won't catch me. No. Exterior side of the road, another spot later. The motorcycle cop is riding a steaming Levo Leo Marvin a ticket. A passing pickup slows and Bob leans out the passenger window. Need any help? No. Remember, be home by seven. The pickup drives on. The motorcycle cop hands Marvin a ticket. Marvin gets back into his car and throws it in gear, and the car jerks backward on the guardrail. Yet. Marvin throws it in a forward. The car, fender dented, tears away. Exterior porch of a country house, late afternoon. Sitting on the porch of his house, an old man watches Marvin's car slow to the stop on the road. Tire under the dented fender is torn and ribbons by the metal in the car show is now riding on the rim. Marvin stops, gets out of the car, and looks at the tire. First he ruins my life, now he ruins my tire. Cursing to himself, Marvin walks to the trunk and removes a jack. Ah, damn, son of a bitch and Bob! A woman comes out of the house and joins the old man. They watch in silence as Marvin jacks up his car. As he twists and grimaces and kicks off the lug nuts, he start, it starts to rain. Hit piss crap, son of a bitching douchebag asshole. Three more people come out on the porch to watch. As Marvin struggles, the car slips off the jack and slams to the pavement. Marvin begins kicking the tire and hitting it with the jack. What about Bob? Think about Bob. What about Bob? What about Bob? What about Bob? Exterior Marvin House, dusk. Mumbling to himself, soaking wet. A filthy tire with grime. Marvin walks to his house. He kicks open the front door. I'm home. Interior Marvin House, Marvin's point of view. Lights go on. 30 people stand around the room with party favors and drinks. In unison, they yell. Surprise! Surprise! Surprise. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, 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 Leo Marvin. Happy birthday. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> singing tapers into silence. Flabbergasted by Marvin's disheveled appearance, the party guests stare. Faye and the kids approach tentatively. Dad, what, what happened? Nothing. Leo, look at yourself. Just a little car trouble, hon. I'm fine. Faye is speechless. So are Siggy and Anna. Not wanting to let things sink, party head, party hearty well wishers approach Leo. Happy birthday, Leo. Some night to have car trouble. You almost missed your own surprise party. Happy birthday, Dr. M. Marvin turns and stares at Bob. I couldn't miss your birthday. Marvin suddenly leaps at Bob and grabs him by the throat. He pushes him through three rooms of the house, choking him. I want you dead. Dead, you hear me? Dead! Marvin falls on the floor on top of Bob. Guests go to pull him off. Interior Marvin bedroom. Marvin lies in the bed in a darkened room. You can hear the party guests huddle outside the hall, whispering. A guest whom we recognize as the doctor number three from the boat, the man who's telling this story, enters carrying his doctor's bag. He approaches Faye, who is wringing her hands. Both speak in whispers loud enough for Marvin to decipher. I've never seen him like this, Phil. He's got this delusion about Bob Riley being the cause of all these problems, and I don't know what to do. He's under a lot of stress, Faye. His book, 
his interview, which frankly didn't go so well, his birthday. That's a lot to bite off all at once. I'll give him a sedative and he'll be fine. Do you really think so? Phil puts a hand on Faye's ha hand and nods. Interior Marvin living room. Bob sits on the couch beside Siggy. Anna approaches. You feeling better? I'm fine. Is your dad? It's your dad. I'm worried about. How is he? Upstairs, resting. I can't understand why he'd attack you like that. Anna sits next to Bob. Bob sees George Stark standing across the room, smiling at Anna. I can't either. But one thing I've learned about psychiatrists, they're brilliant manipulators. I trust your dad completely. I'm sure everything he's done has been to help me. How come you aren't making a move on George Stark? Bob, we've talked about this. No, you, you've talked about it, and I've listened. In my opinion, George Stark's smile is not Oedipal regression and it's not confused libido. It's one good-looking guy drooling over you, Anna Marvin. Bob. Go ask if you can put your tongue in his mouth. I hear it works every time. Anna smiles and summons her courage and smilingly approaches George. He's clearly delighted and a woman walks up to Bob. Hi. Faye said to introduce myself. I'm Lily, Leo's neurotic sister. We saw Lily Marvin's picture in, Lily, in Leo's office. Bob stands delighted. A pleasure. I'm neurotic too. Really? What a coincidence. Am I disturbing you? Only in a good way. Sit down. She does. It must be nice having an analyst in the family. I don't know. Ask Leo. I'm an analyst, too. You're kidding! Interior Marvin's darkened room. Phil empties a large syringe into Marvin's buttock. He swats Marvin's hand behind and par Marvin pulls up his PJs. That should give you some interesting ideas for your next book. You might even wake up feeling happy. I doubt it. Phil, do you remember a classmate named Finsterwald? Carswell Finsterwald? Sure. Who could forget? I've forgotten and I don't know why. Did anything unusual happen with him? You're joking. Do I act like a man who's joking? Relax, Leo. I just can't believe you'd block something like that out. Carswell was at Harvard with us. You turned him in for cheating. What? Don't you remember? You brought action against him for stealing your psychoanalyst notes. They booted him. The only place that would take him after was a, a University of Guadalajara. Marvin tries to speak, but nothing comes out of his mouth. Tomsky watches with concern. Leo, is there something about Carswell that's disturbing you? Leo? Thanks, Phil. Enjoy the party. Phil lingers, then leaves. Closing the door, Marvin begins shaking all over. As he does, the bed rattles rapidly against the wall. Leo's losing it. He's no longer the same sane man. In the darkness, we hear... Baby steps. Make a plan. Interior Marvin's bedroom, the middle of the night. Faye sleeps soundly next to Marvin, who is wide awake, staring at the ceiling, twitching. Marvin pulls himself carefully out of bed and crawls on the floor to the door. Exterior Marvin house. Marvin, carrying his shoes, crawls outside. He tries to put his shoes on and fa falls flat on his face. He then pulls himself up and hobbles away. Exterior Winnipesaukee General Store morning. This is where Marvin family was shopping when Bob first came to town. Marvin play paces outside until the owner opens the front door for business. Interior store. Marvin wanders through the hardware selection looking around. Fred, the owner, works behind the counter. Can I help you, doctor? I want to buy a gun. Okay. Fred walks to a case. I've got Winchesters, Colts. What do you plan on hunting? Uh, an animal. Uh, this tall. 170 pounds, Bermuda shorts. Take a look at this baby. It'll shoot through anything, but it also leaves a clean wound. 
He hands Marvin a rifle. Marvin examines it. Your wife was in with that Bob fellow. Sure is a nice guy. What do you have that leaves a messy wound? Angle on the cash register area. Fred is ringing up Marvin's purchase. Two rifles and a box of shells. I'll need your driver's license, social security number, and you can pick them up on Friday. The 18th. The 18th? There's a two-week waiting period in this state. I can't wait two weeks. I need these now. He grabs the rifles. Fred keeps a firm grip, grip on them. Dr. Marvin, it's the law. Fred wins the tug-of-war, and Marvin stares at him. What about explosives? Any waiting period there? Exterior Bob's cottage. Marvin, carrying a bag and singing to himself, walks up to the cottage. He looks around and kicks open the door. Interior Bob's cottage. The place looks completely anonymous except for Gil in a bowl on, and Bob's bag of clothes. Marvin sits on the floor, filling a pair of milk cartons with gray powder. Bob fell into a burning ring of fire. He went down, 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 and the flames went higher. And it burned, 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 that ring of fire, the ring of fire. Marvin removes the wired mechanism from the bag and a timer. He delicately pushes the wires into the milk cartons and carefully ties some fuse wires. He puts the milk cartons and wired mechanisms into a backpack and puts it under Bob's bed. He begins lying, laying the fuse wire along the floor towards the door. Marvin passes Gil, sitting on a table. Marvin picks up the bowl and puts it under the bed next to the bomb. How dare you do this to a fish, dude? He then goes back laying the wire into the kitchenette. Exterior Bob's cottage. Marvin lays the fuse wire across the room and out the door. He closes the door and starts to set the timer when he spots a note hanging on the nearby mailbox. Dear Mr. and Mrs. G, if I'm not here, I'm at the Marvins. Would you feed Gil? Thanks, Bob. P.S. Your denture adhesives arrived, so I put them in your mailbox. Enjoy. Bob. Marvin seethes. He thinks a moment, when, then heads back to the cottage. Momentarily, he returns, carrying the backpack and the long wire fuse. Interior Marvin House. Bob, Anna, and Siggy sit around watching Faye on the phone. Well, if you hear from him, Donna, please call. Thanks. She hangs up. Nobody's seen him. She stands and gets her purse off the table. I'm going looking for him. Me too. Me too. Me too. Shouldn't somebody stay here in case he comes back? I'll stay. Bob? I'll stay. We'll leave him a note. She pauses, then stops in front of Bob. Bob, I'm not defending Leo's recent behavior in any way, so please don't take this personally. However, rational the response, Leo is so upset with you that I think it would be best if you weren't around when he comes back. Really? Yeah, Mom, why? Because I say so, Siggy. Please don't think it's the way I want it. It's just that Leo's not himself. It's not Bob's fault. Listen to your mom, Siggy. I'll, all of you get out of here, okay? I'll straighten up before I go, and when Dr. M comes home, everything will be exactly the way he likes it. Bob, you're such a dear. Take good care, all right? Faye hugs Bob, and so does Anna. You give George a chance, okay? Anna nods, and Bob turns to Siggy, who's upset. Bob holds out his hand. Give me leather, ass wiping bastard head. Siggy swats Bob's hand. Green puking piss in it. The family and Bob exchange pregnant goodbye looks, and then Faye and Siggy and Anna exit. Bye, fam. New angle out the living room window. Bob watches as the Marvin family walks away. They wave. Bob waves back sadly. He shuffles across the room and stops at the puppets on the mantel. I guess this is goodbye, fam. Bob shuffles to Marvin's chair. He stares at the book Marvin has been trying to read. Troy's Understanding Dreams, then casually opens it. He reads for a moment, gets interested in it, and sits down. 
He sits back in Marvin's chair, reading. Dissolve to interior Marvin house later. Bob is asleep in Marvin's chair. Freud's understanding dreams open on his chest. Suddenly, Marvin's face pops up in the window. He looks in, sees Bob, then ducks back down. Momentarily, the front door is to the cottage is kicked open and there stands a seething Marvin. Get up and don't make a sound. Dr. M, everybody's looking for you. Marvin brandishes the backpack. I said shut up. Okay, you're the duck. Exterior Marvin house. Marvin carrying the backpack leads Bob outside. Bob looks... Where are we going? Hiking? Into the woods. Is this a new form of therapy? Yes, Bob. It's death therapy. It's a guaranteed cure. Death therapy. I like it. Marvin leads Bob into the woods beside the cottage. Exterior woods near the house. Bob sits on the stump. Marvin puts the backpack on Bob's shoulders, then starts try tying his hands behind him. Bob sits passively, letting him. This is pretty imaginative, Dr. M. Will this be in your new book? If it is, I'll dedicate it to you. How's that? Great. Ow. That hurts. Ow. Marvin keeps tying Bob's hands. What is this now? Pain therapy? Exactly. Now yell and scream and suffer. Ow! 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 That really hurts! Marvin sets the timer and walks away. Say hello to Freud for me. Dr. Marvin walks out of the woods. Dr. M, this really hurts. Love hurts. <laughs> Interior Marvin has living room. Marvin enters looking happy. He goes to the stereo, puts on Neil Diamond's Penny Arcade, and cranks it up loud, and goes to the window and opens it. Music to die by, Bob! Marvin does a little dance and talks to himself. Oh, I guess it was suicide, Faye. He tried it once, remember? Just goes to show you never can tell. Exterior woods. Bob sits trying to get comfortable. I'm worried about getting gangrene, Dr. M. I think I get the point. He struggles some more. At least I, I think I get the point. Maybe I'm not supposed to sit here. Maybe I'm supposed to undo these outer knots. He begins struggling to untie himself. So that my inner knots, these strong, restricting inner knots... You get the hand free. ...will come undone, too. Both hands are free. Bob stands. Yes! Interior Marvin House living room. Marvin is still dancing around, looking at his watch. He holds up five, four, three, two, one fingers, then preps for an explosion. Instead, Bob opens the door. Ah! Still wearing the backpack, Bob walks into the room. Death therapy cured me, you genius! Marvin runs across the room away from Bob. No! Yes! I used to be so afraid of everything. It was like dying a thousand deaths a day. Now that you showed me I have only one death to be afraid of, I'm not afraid of anything anymore. No! Marvin runs out the back door of the house and Bob stands there watching him. Don't be so modest. Exterior Marvin Dock Day. Marvin runs out the dock and tries to start the little motorboat and sits there. Bob starts the back out the back door of the house, casually tosses the backpack onto a chair, and then follows Marvin. Dr. M? Bob walks... Sorry. Bob walks into the, onto the dock. Marvin is working frantically to start the motorboat, motorboat. Dr. M, I'm really cured. The house explodes. Debris rains down on Bob and Marvin. After it settles, the bust of Freud lands on the dock in front of them. Did somebody leave the gas on? Why won't you go away? I disgraced myself on national television. No one will buy my book. My family is going to hate me. Dr. M, your family loves you. I'm finished! Marvin is about to attack Bob, then stands limp. A beaten man. What's left of the house is now burning. The Gutmans have run out of their trailer. Burn. 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 In the distance, sirens approach. Dr. M, you have the crown jewels of England all around you. 
you have a wife with a generous heart. You have great kids and an incredible sister. Stay away from my sister. Dr. M, you have a fan. Marvin stares at Bob and then takes a small can of gas from the old motorboat and pours it on himself. The sirens get closer. You know, I'm beginning to think you're an ingrate. What? People are miserable all over the world and you're killing yourself? You should be ashamed. Don't talk that way to me. Maybe I was wrong about you. Do you hear me? Maybe you're not so good after all. Marvin leaps on Bob. I'll kill you. Marvin attacks Bob on the dock. Fire trucks arrive. Faye and the family drive up too. A couple of firemen in the family rush to separate Marvin and Bob. Long dissolve to exterior doctor's houseboat sunset. The doctors and their wives sit around Phil stunned. Off their bow is the slab that was once Marvin house. And they took him away. My God, it was insanity. Bob drove Marvin to complete insanity. What happened? Leo was taken to the Tomsky Institute for a few days for observation. He lost his medical license, of course. A doctor can't try to kill one of his patients and expect to get away with it. God, well, thank God for that. I mean, you know, I mean, then what happened? Leo was returned to his family. Exterior of the Tomsky convalescent home. Leo stands, small suitcase in hand, looking sad and fragile. Faye, Anna, Siggy, Lily, and Bob get out of the station wagon and look at him. No one says a word. Then Bob goes up and puts his arm around Leo. Leo stands motionless, shell-shocked. Bob and the family rented a lakeside cottage where they could help Leo recuperate. Exterior of the lawn of the lakeside cottage. Gil's bowl sits on the lawn table. In addition to Gil, the bowl now contains several baby guppies. Marvin lies on a, a deck chair covered with a blanket, staring into nowhere. Bob is next to him talking on a cordless phone. I understand. Sure. He hangs up and puts the phone down. Tough business. Bob makes some notes in his organizer, then gets up. He grabs hold of both of Leo's shoulders. I'm going over here. I'll be right over here. Leo doesn't look at him. A zombie would seem more alive. Bob goes and joins the volleyball game. Okay, I'm with Siggy. Marvin start, sits staring into nowhere. The phone rings again. Phone. The volleyball game continues. Phone. After another ring, he reaches for it. Hello? May I speak to Bob, please? Bob's unavailable right now. Can I take a message? I'm Mr. Jameson with the Tucson School District. Bob contacted us about buying some toothbrushes, but we're going to have to cancel the order. Tucson canceling order. Any message why? It's not a priority right now. Not priority right now. Why? Well, money's tight and... Sure. But you know, there is another way to look at it. What's that? Well, if you give a new toothbrush and taught dental hygiene to every student at your school, in the long run, you'd save them thousands of dollars. I mean, look at the cost of dental bills. I bet I could have put my kids through college with what I've spent on fillings. That's an interesting point. It is, isn't it? Maybe you should try the toothbrushes. They might do a lot for education by saving teeth. Uh, I never thought of it. Never thought of that. I I'll tell you what. Tell Bob... We'll take the order and see how it goes. Right. Marvin hangs up the phone. He's effectless, his effectless pr expression suddenly turns to one full of thought. Hey. Marvin sits up, gaining energy, even enthusiasm. Hey. The Marvin family hurries over. Neil Marvin now makes toothbrushes. Bob puts his arm around Leo, and he gestures and talks more and more animatedly to his delighted family. The irony, of course, is that Bob brought the family closer than they'd ever been before. Harvey Green saw Leo last month and said he'd never look happier. Exterior of the doctor's houseboat. The doctors are stunned. My God, the poor bastard. And you thought you had nightmares. Unbelievable. What happened to Bob? 
the others jump in with, yeah, what about Bob? What about Bob? What about Bob? Bob married Lily and had triplets. He went back to school, got a degree in marriage family counseling, and now has a big practice on Park and 75th. Interior Bob Wiley's Manhattan office. Bob sits in the shrinks chair, sitting in three chairs in front of him are the father, mother, and son. Douchebag. Bastard head. Son of a bitch. Try asswipe of the universe. Asswipe of the universe. Family look at each other, tears well, and they hug. Excellent. Exterior, the doctor's on the boat. The doctors look at each other in astonishment. Wait a minute. You're not telling me that Bob Wiley is Dr. Robert S. Wiley, the psychologist? That's exactly what I'm telling you. A big houseboat goes by and Phil yells to it. Hey, Bob. Hello, Bob. Angle on the big houseboat. Bob is surrounded by Lily Marvin, three toddlers, and lots of friends. Smiling, Bob waves at the doctors. Wrote that huge bestseller? What's it called? Bob's boat turns. On its stern, in huge letters is its name. Vacation Therapy. Vacation Therapy. Exactly. Sold two million copies. Angle on the doctor's boat, who are dark green with envy. I don't believe it. Pinch me. I'll never take another vacation as long as I live. Angle on Bob's houseboat. As the other doctors second in agreement, we see Bob's hugely happy houseboat motors off. We see Bob's big smile as he passes out Kleenex to his family, then waves goodbye to the doctors. Roll end credits. The end. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yay. Well, thank you for joining us if anybody was watching this. Y'all did amazing. I love when my friends do these things. So thanks for watching, everybody. Have a great night. Bye.